Hello and welcome to the March presentation of The Nutritionist 2020. I'm Marianne Fessenden from AMTS. We have a great talk coming up today. As a reminder to those listening, our format is to deliver a recorded presentation at two times on the webinar day with the presenter joining at the end of each session to answer questions from the listening audience. The educational web webinars are multinational. I have several co-hosts who join to deliver the presentations translated into their country's language and field the questions from their countrymen. Paula Torillo, co-host from Argentina in the afternoon. We are joined by several of our AMTS distributors. Elena Bonfante of Italy is a regular co-host. She was not able to join this time. And Sean Lee from China joined us in the morning webinar. Vadim Bekchevnikov joins from Russia and Marcelo Hens Ramos from Brazil was also not able to join this time. While some of the co-hosts may be not able to rebroadcast in their own language, their questions give an opportunity for consideration of viewpoints of concern in different farming systems. Depending on how you are listening, you can submit queries through me or one of my attending co-hosts. Later, a complete recording of the archived webinars, as well as a question and answer session for each, will be available on the AMTS website. For those of you who would listen to the presentations whilst driving, we have converted the videos into MP3 files that can be downloaded for offline listening. Those podcasts can be found at the Ag Model System website under the Webinar tab or Resources tab. Our goal with this webinar series is to bring information about ruminant nutrition that is important to you. I have received many requests for our next speaker. Dr. Jesse Golf from Iowa State University Veterinary College is a noted teacher and researcher in the area of hypocalcemia. After receiving his undergraduate degree in microbiology from Cornell University, he worked in the poultry industry for long enough to decide to return to school for advanced degrees. He earned his master's in physiology from Iowa State University before pursuing his veterinary degree at ISU. After working as a large animal vet immediately after graduation, he was asked by the United States Department of Agriculture to consider getting a PhD. He joined the Metabolic Diseases Research Group as part of the National Animal Disease Center for 22 years. Jesse then left the public sector to head research and development at West Central Farmers Cooperative in Ralston, Iowa. While there, in addition to nutritional cons counseling, he developed products used to manage and prevent hypocalcemia. Most recently, Dr. Golf has returned to academia at Iowa State University Veterinary College, where he taught physiology and nutrition until May 2019. Now a professor emeritus, Jesse is developing research ideas for products for both man and animal. Jesse grew up in the Hudson Valley of New York State and lives with his Iowan dairy farm raised wife and four children on a small farm outside of Ames, Iowa. There he raises chickens, horses, and has two Jersey cows and likes to go fishing whenever he can. Please now enjoy Jesse's presentation. Remember to jot down any questions you have during the presentation and type them in the Q&A window. We'll have an opportunity for Jesse to answer those questions after the presentation. Okay, today we're gonna to talk about hypocalcemia, which is low blood calcium, and the causes of it and strategies we can use to hopefully reduce it in our dairy cows. Around the year 2001, I was involved in a survey of cows all across the United States. And we looked at cows that had calved within 36 hours of our visit to the farm. And this represents about 2,300 blood samples taken from cows on about 220 different dairy farms all across the United States. We took those samples back to the laboratory and ran a blood calcium concentration. And we decided that if normal blood calcium is nine to 10 milligrams per deciliter. We decided anybody below eight, we'd say was in a subclinical hypocalcemia zone. If they were below 5.5 milligrams per deciliter, we said that's indicative of clinical milk fever. What surprised us was not the idea that 7% of the cows develop milk fever every year. That was pretty common around the year 2001. But what was surprising was how many of the cows developed this subclinical hypocalcemia, fully half of the older cows. So why is subclinical hypocalcemia important? Well, if we look at the transition cow, she basically has this issue with hypocalcemia or low blood calcium, and that affects muscle tone. And of course, if it's very severe, we lose skeletal muscle control, 
which is that syndrome known as milk fever with a cow that's recumbent, is unable to stand on its feet. But if you have less, hypo, less hypocalcemia than the milk fever cow, you still have effects on smooth muscle, particularly the smooth muscles that make up the sphincters at the end of the teat. If that doesn't close properly, it's an open avenue for mastitis. Lack of smooth muscle contraction means we're more likely to develop a displaced abomasum where gas is allowed to build up in the abomasum. And of course, a cow who is not eating or has hypocalcemia does not eat very well, which means she now becomes at risk of decreasing dry matter intake, exacerbating the negative energy and protein balance, which feeds into immune suppression. Kyoko Kimura in my lab actually showed quite nicely that hypocalcemia in and of itself is immunosuppressive. What this means is that hypocalcemia has been linked to a lot of other common syndromes seen in the transition cow. Cows with hypocalcemia are much greater risk of developing metritis in the first 10 days after calving. A lot more ketosis is seen in hypocalcemic cows colostrum quality, uterine prolapse, displaced abomasum, all these are associated with a cow that's got hypocalcemia, not simply milk fever. So if we're going to understand calcium and how to control it in the cow right after she's calved, we need to look at some of the dynamics of calcium in the transition cow. Let's take a look at a cow who's one day away from having a, a calf. Let's say it's a 650 kilogram cow. She needs about seven to eight grams of calcium to support her maintenance requirement. So this is the loss of secretions from the pancreas that go into the gut, loss of urine, calcium. It's only about seven to eight grams of calcium per day. She's also carrying a fetus, and that fetus is developing a new skeleton. That takes nine to 10 grams of calcium per day. Add those up. We need to remove 16 to 18 grams of calcium from the blood, and that must be restored to the blood if we're going to maintain normal blood calcium concentrations. So if a cow is fed a diet that's at least 0.39% calcium, which virtually all dry cow diets are going to meet that level, she will get all the calcium she needs to support her maintenance, plus the little calf's fetal skeleton development. Now let's look at her right after she has that calf. And we're gonna look at just the first 14 hours. And I chose this number, you'll see very quickly why I chose 14 hours. If we've got this cow, oops, her maintenance requirement is about seven to eight grams of calcium per day still. She makes colostrum. Average cow makes seven and a half kilograms of colostrum with 2.3 grams of calcium per kilogram. You've lost 17 and a quarter grams of calcium. Now this is the interesting thing. This is old work that Dr. Charlie Ramberg did at University of Pennsylvania using radioactive calcium. He showed that within 45 minutes of removal of the colostrum, that, that mammary gland would take up three quarters of the calcium needed to make the next milk in that mammary gland. So within 45 minutes of removing the colostrum, I'm gonna pull another 10 to 12 grams of calcium out of the blood. Second milking, 12 hours after calving, she's gonna lose about 8.7 kilograms of milk, which contains 1.7 grams of calcium per kilogram, about 14.8 grams of calcium. Now again, Within 45 minutes of the second milking, that mammary gland takes up an additional eight to 10 grams of calcium, three quarters of the 15 grams of calcium needed to make the next milk. So we have to think of the dynamics of this. Within that first 14 hours after calving, this cow is going to lose seven to eight for maintenance, six, 17 for colostrum, 14 for the next milking plus eight to 10 grams for, in preparation for the 24 hour milking. That amounts to about 50 grams of calcium in that first 14 hours that are leaving the blood. That represents an increase from the day before calving, 50 grams of calcium minus 18, about 32 grams of extra calcium that she has to bring into her blood if her blood calcium is to 
remain somewhat normal. The only way she can do this is make it up from dietary calcium absorption or remove calcium from her bones. Most cows don't get milk fever, so it's important to understand how is it that they avoid this disease. If we take a look at this big Holstein cow, she'll only have about three and a half grams of calcium in all of her serum. That's all, three and a half grams of calcium. Luckily, she has a parathyroid gland, and that parathyroid gland is very sensitive to any kind of change in blood calcium concentration. The parathyroid sits next to your thyroid gland in the neck, and a branch of the carotid artery runs through it. Anytime blood calcium falls, parathyroid hormone is secreted in very large amounts. Now, one of its actions is on the bone. And the idea is we're gonna remove calcium from that skeletal system where it's been stored. There's two mechanisms by which calcium can be released from the skeleton. The first one, we're gonna look at trabecular bone or this spongy bone that makes up the bone marrow. We're gonna take this square and look at it under a little higher power and you can see all these nice spicules of bone here. We're gonna look at one of those under the microscope and it stains pink. And you can see these cells scattered throughout the bone. Bone is a living tissue. It's not, it's not like a piece of hard calcium and phosphate that just sits there. It's a living tissue. Each of these cells, known as osteocytes, has a small amount of fluid surrounding it. And under the influence of parathyroid hormone, all these little cells are connected to each other. Under the influence of parathyroid hormone, they can take that calcium in that bone fluid and pump it into the bloodstream. And that will bring a small amount of calcium into the bloodstream very quickly. We think that amount of calcium is anywhere from nine grams of calcium to as much as 15 grams of calcium that can be moved from this bone fluid into the blood very quickly. Notice the little asterisk here. The 15 grams is what's been found in cows that were fed an anionic diet. Anionic diets improve or increase the amount of calcium in that bone fluid. Now we're going to look at osteoclast recruitment and activation. Osteoclasts are these big giant cells, and these cells are actively chewing into the bone and releasing calcium and phosphorus back into the bloodstream. And that's great. They can remove a lot of calcium from the skeleton, upwards of one kilogram over the course of four or five weeks. So they are very, very active once they get started. The problem is they're a little slow to get started and we'll talk about that in a bit. Another action of parathyroid hormone is to work on the kidney and get the kidney to take this vitamin D that we feed cows and convert it to a new hormone called 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. And this hormone will stimulate the intestine to absorb more calcium from the diet. Now we feed our cows vitamin D. Theoretically, they could make it in their skin if they saw enough sunlight. But that vitamin D is biologically inactive until it goes through some metabolism steps, the last one being in the kidney. And if the kidney has been properly stimulated by this parathyroid hormone, it turns that vitamin D into a new hormone called 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, which acts primarily on intestine and bone cells. Here's my little picture of a intestinal lining. I've got three different cells here, epithelial cells connected to each other by what are called tight junctions. Out here in the lumen of the gut, I've got some calcium atoms that were in my diet. And now I've got 125 vitamin D coming in from the kidney and reaching the intestinal epithelial cells. They bind to a vitamin D receptor and that stimulates the transcription and translation of a couple of different proteins. One of them is called calcium binding protein. It grabs calcium from the diet, this dietary calcium that's out here in the lumen of the gut and captures it and carries it across the cell and dumps it off to this second vitamin D dependent 
protein called calcium ATPase. And this actually is a pump. And we'll take the calcium from the binding protein and pump it into the bloodstream. And when this works well, we're going to be able to absorb calcium very nicely from our diet and put it into the bloodstream. Now, 125 vitamin D also stimulates the intestinal transport of phosphorus, phosphate, and that's needed for bone formation. So if you think about this system, it's been designed to help build bone. To build bone, I've got to absorb calcium and I've got to absorb phosphorus. Now 125 vitamin D comes in from the kidney again, binds to its receptor, and this time it causes production of a sodium phosphate transporter that's going to grab phosphorus out of our diet along with a sodium atom and transport them across the cell and put them to a phosphate pump and pump phosphate into the blood. We're going to come back to this idea of the role of phosphate pumping in milk fever and hypocalcemia in a few minutes. All right, that's the active transport of calcium that's dependent on vitamin D. There is a second method of taking calcium from the diet and moving it across the gut. This is a vitamin D independent passive transport of calcium. It only works when there's a lot of calcium atoms sitting out here in the lumen of the gut. In fact, the ionized calcium concentration in the lumen has to be greater than six millimolar to actually get this system to work. When it works, Calcium starts moving between the cells of the intestine and moving into the blood. It's short-lived. It doesn't absorb a lot of calcium this way, but it certainly can be taken advantage of when people give calcium gels, calcium drenches, the oral calcium boluses. For a short period of time, you raise calcium in the lumen of the gut so high that you drive calcium between the cells into the bloodstream. So a short-term fix that many farmers use in transition cows to try to give them a little boost of calcium at the time of calving. And we'll come back to that idea again later too. So how long does it take for the calcium homeostatic system to react? If we look at the kidney, uh, parathyroid hormone brings calcium back from the urine, from the renal fluid, within minutes. But normally, this is a very small amount of calcium, less than one gram of calcium moves into the blood. We can also look at how fast the kidney can make this hormone called 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. And it, it will increase in the blood within 8 to 16 hours. 8 in cows that are fed anionic diets, 16 hours or longer in cows that are fed a very high DCAD diet. We'll come back to that in a little bit, too. The intestinal tract needs about 12 to 24 hours of stimulation by 125 vitamin D before you see a significant increase in the proteins, that calcium binding protein, the calcium pump, that are needed for calcium absorption. We look at the bone, the osteocytic osteolysis, minutes. Within a few minutes to maybe a few hours, we'll pull that nine grams of calcium maybe as much as 15 grams of calcium in an anion cow, back into the bloodstream. Osteoclastic resorption takes considerably longer, 36 hours in young animals or animals that are on anionic diets versus maybe 96 hours for older cows on high DCAD diets. But it can bring a very large amount of calcium into the blood of the animal over the course of days to weeks. Not all cows get milk fever. For most cows, this system of controlling blood calcium works quite nicely. Why doesn't it work in all cows? Well, we know that as cows get older, the number of vitamin D receptors in their intestine declines. Not much we can do about that unless we decide to milk heifers. Again, for older cows, they're no longer growing, so they don't have these osteoclast, osteoclast site cells sitting in their bones anymore. So for them to respond to PTH through the osteoclastic bone resorption, they've got to recruit new osteoclasts 
and then activate them. That takes time. A heifer only has to activate the osteoclasts that are already there because her bone is actively growing. So that's why heifers are probably much more resistant to developing hypocalcemia than older cows. Finally, we now know that the blood pH affects whether or not the tissues will respond to parathyroid hormone. This is a study we did some years ago to look and see what is it about a high DCAD diet or low DCAD diet? In other words, an anionic diet versus no anion diet. This is an experiment with older Jersey cows in late gestation. And ordinarily, if you gave them parathyroid hormone, you should expect the calcium to rise in the blood and you should expect them to make 125 dihydroxyvitamin D in their kidney. Here we have cows and we gave them synthetic parathyroid hormone every three hours during the course of this experiment. So every, every cow got the same exact stimulation from parathyroid hormone. If the cow had been fed a high DCAD diet with very high potassium, you see that their responsiveness to the injections is actually quite low. Eventually, their blood calcium comes up, but it's much more muted than it is in the cows that were on the anionic diet, a low DCAD diet. Here you see the very robust response in blood calcium. Similarly, if we look at the ability of the kidney to make 125 vitamin D, if they've been fed a high DCAD diet, high in potassium, they make some 125 vitamin D, but it's nowhere near as much or as fast as in the cows that got the anionic diet. What this led us to show was that cows and their ability to respond to parathyroid hormone is affected by the pH of their blood. When you feed a high potassium diet, you alkalinize a cow's blood. When you feed them an anionic diet, their blood pH actually goes slightly on the acid side. So here we've got a cow with a blood pH of about 7.35, compensated metabolic acidosis, similar to what you and I are sitting at here right now. She also has normal blood magnesium. So when parathyroid hormone is secreted in response to the decreasing blood calcium concentration after calving, it binds to its receptor in a nice lock and key fit. And that stimulates adenocyclase, which stimulates cyclic AMP production, and tells the interior of the cell to go ahead and become active. So the kidney cell starts making 125 vitamin D. The bone cells will start resorbing calcium and pumping it into the blood. When this works, the animal has a small drop in blood calcium for a short period of time, and very quickly recovers her blood calcium back to normal status. However, if we feed this cow an alkaline diet, one that's high in potassium, she goes into a compensated metabolic alkalosis. Unfortunately, this changes the shape of that receptor on the bone and on the kidney tissue. And so now when parathyroid hormone is secreted because blood calcium is declining, this animal doesn't respond. The bone cells, the kidney cells, they're surrounded by parathyroid hormone, but they fail to respond. These cows get severe hypocalcemia until this system fixes or is overwhelmed by very, very large amounts of parathyroid hormone for a long period of time. We're gonna come back to this third panel later. In this panel, the magnesium atom that you see in panels A and B, that magnesium atom is missing. And if a magnesium atom is missing, Again, parathyroid hormone is, re is released. It binds to its receptor, but the adenocyclase enzyme complex can't respond. And again, the animal develops severe hypocalcemia. Well, let's start going through some milk fever prevention strategies. If potassium is the problem causing this cow to become alkaline, let's avoid feeding these high potassium forages. So our choices are, are to start setting aside some acres of land that will be used for growing dry cow hay 
That means no manure will be applied to that land for years. We can choose to use warm season grasses instead of cool season grasses for these cows. One of the best warm season grasses to use is corn silage. Corn is a warm season grass. Here in the Midwest, we've got our prairie haze, the big blue stems, little blue stems, uh, Indian grass. All those kinds of grasses tend to be very low in potassium compared to the cool season grasses. They also tend to be less digestible. Another choice is to go to straw diets. The high straw diets can be made to have low potassium, particularly here in the Midwest again, wheat straw tends to be a good choice. Oat straw, not so good a choice because typically oats are grown as a cover crop for alfalfa, which means when they apply potash to the soil, potassium chloride, it picks up that potassium and puts it into the oat straw as well. After we've done all we can agronomically, we're going to turn to anions. And we're going to add these anions or negatively charged chloride and sulfate molecules to the diet to try to decrease the blood pH, acidify the cow. We'll also be looking at urine pH in these animals because urine pH is a good reflection of blood pH. So on many of the slides that follow, I'll focus on urine pH, but realize that reflects the fact that I've changed the blood pH. One of the problems with the whole anionic salt business has been that they can acidify the blood and improve tissue response and parathyroid hormone, but they tend to be unpalatable and there's possibilities of over acidifying cows. So one of your jobs is to choose the right anion source. Some years ago, we looked at various anionic salts or possible salts that could be used to acidify a cow when added to the diet. And here again, I'm presenting urine pH. Remember, this reflect, reflects blood pH. If I add water, the urine pH is about 8.3. If I add elemental sulfur, flowers of sulfur, no change. Mag sulfate or Epsom salts, calcium sulfate, gypsum, not a big change in urine pH. That came as a surprise when we did this experiment because we had thought mag sulfate was particularly effective when added to the cow's diet. Today, I believe probably some of those results were because the magnesium and the magnesium sulfate was quite available and making a difference. One of the things that surprised us when we did this experiment was we added sulfuric acid to the diet of cows. Now, sulfuric acid is a very strong acid. We took the paint off of our mixer wagon, and yet when you feed it to the cow, it didn't really acidify the cow's blood or urine that much. It's because the sulfate is not absorbed that well into the bloodstream. When you look at the chloride salts, calcium chloride, ammonium chloride, they're much stronger acidifiers, and it's because chloride, that anion, is absorbed into the blood with about 100% efficiency from the diet. Sulfate, we think maybe about 60% efficient. Then we come all the way to hydrochloric acid. Of course, hydrochloric acid has no corresponding cation. There's no ammonium cation, no calcium cation coming with it, and it's a very strong acidifier. That probably would have been the end of the story, except that we also noticed that hydrochloric acid was the most palatable of these salts that we were using at the time. So we need to choose an anion source that's acidifying and somewhat palatable. Palatability issues were a plague of the anion programs early on. Um, this is what killed the DCAD institution on farms until some commercial products were developed. Now, typically with anionic salts, you would see about a one and a half kilogram dry matter intake depression all the way through this pre-calving period. Now here I have to tell you my commercial angle here. I am the inventor of soy chlor, and so I may be biased here, but you can substitute soy chlor 
BioClor, a number of the anion products that are commercially sold on the market were developed for the same reason SoyClor was. They improve dry matter intake. And so you can get those cows to eat that anion preparation, get acidified, and yet maintain that big difference in dry matter intake up until the time of calving. Particularly important is to minimize the depression in dry matter intake we see as cows approach calving. Let's take a look at what we think the mineral profile should be for cows that are fed a reasonable close-up diet. For me, I like to see diet phosphorus at about 0.25 to 0.31 percent. This is lower than perhaps I recommended in the past, and I will now show you why I've changed that recommendation. Do you remember how we talked about the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D also stimulates intestinal phosphorus absorption. We now know that there's a new hormone on the scene. Whenever blood phosphorus rises above normal levels, just even just a little bit, that stimulates the bone cells to produce this new hormone called fibroblast growth factor 23. This strange little hormone coming from the bone acts on the kidney and depresses the ability of the kidney to make 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Well, if I don't have 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, I can't absorb dietary phosphorus and my blood phosphorus will fall. If I need phosphorus in the blood, the bone cells quit making fibroblast growth factor, stimulates the kidney to make 125 vitamin D and I get an increase in blood phosphorus. So. If we're feeding too much phosphorus to our cows prior to calving, we're stimulating this production of fibroblast growth factor 23. This is wonderful for phosphorus homeostasis. It's going to drop blood phosphorus. But if I block the production of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, I've also blocked the ability of the intestine to absorb calcium. And that's why we think feeding lower phosphorus diets to these dry cows is a good idea. This is a study Dave Beatty did, and I was lucky enough to help him out. Um, they fed three different diets. One was 0.21% phosphorus, 0.31% phosphorus, or 0.44% phosphorus to close up dry cows. The cows that fed the higher phosphorus diets had lower blood calcium concentration around the time of calving than did cows in either of the other two lower phosphorus treatments. Now, the take home message is that these cows with fed these low phosphorus diets had normal blood phosphorus levels and there was no adverse effect seen in milk production. In fact, if you look at the 2001 NRC, it would have told you that this cow only required about 0.23% phosphorus in her diet. Cows do not need to be fed extra phosphorus. And in fact, it's probably counterproductive. The lower you can get that phosphorus, in that close-up diet, the better off the cows will be in terms of calcium homeostasis. Now we'll come back to the slide and we'll look at magnesium. We're gonna set that at 0.4% to take advantage of rumen passive absorption of magnesium. Sulfur, set it between 0.22 and 0.4%. 0.22 is the minimum amount required for the rumen bacteria to make cysteine and methionine. Above 0.4%, you see this depression in sulfate absorption, and there are some problems that have arisen in beef cattle with sulfur toxicity above that level. Calcium, see all these question marks? I have no idea where blood calcium should really be set. I use 0.85 to 1.3%, very similar to the amount of calcium I will feed in my lactating cow ration. We know from experimental work we've done in our lab and a few other labs around the world, anywhere between 0.5% calcium and 1.5% calcium, if the cow's blood pH and urine pH is identical, the effect on blood calcium concentration at parturition will be the same. In other words, it doesn't really matter where you have dietary calcium set from 0.5 to 1.5, so long as the animals are acidified to the same extent. 
Next comes sodium. I need to feed a little bit of sodium to these cows to make sure that they're not sodium deficient. If I feed above 0.2%, I will actually start seeing utter edema. So keep that right at the requirement of the cow, about 0.1 to as much as 0.15% sodium in the diet. Next comes potassium. I want to keep as close to 1% as I possibly can. This is a problem on dairy farms. It's hard for a farmer to find forages that are that low in potassium to feed to the cow. Finally, I'm going to add chloride to the diet to decrease the urine pH. I want to drop that urine pH into a zone that's reflecting a acidic blood pH as well. I need to worry about under acidific under acidifying a cow. If I'm under acidified, I don't get much of an effect on milk fever prevention. I also have to worry about over acidifying a cow. If I give her too many anions, her response will be to quit eating, which is, doesn't mean, means she doesn't get milk fever, but she'll get just about everything else you can think of. So this is a titration curve. If you think about the kidney, it really has problems making urine that's more alkaline than about a pH 8.5. It also can't make a more acidic urine than about pH 5.4. So we're playing in this zone between eight and a half and about 5.4. If I start over here with feeding a high DCAD diet and I start reducing the DCAD by adding anions, I don't see much of a change in urine pH until I get to about plus 100, plus 50, and then all of a sudden the urine pH starts to decline. When I'm at about zero, I'll be at about a urine pH of 7.2, At a decad of about minus 100, minus 75, I will be in this area of about 6.2, 6.3 for urine pH. If I go down here to about minus 150, 175, I will have urine pH down around 5.5. Now, we think that if, unless you can get that urine pH down below 7.4, you're not gonna see much benefit to your acidification program. Between 7.4 and about 6.8, you'll see some benefit, but it's gonna be marginal. If you're down here where we think is optimum, about 6.8 to about 5.9, this seems to be the best place to be for controlling hypocalcemia and maintaining feed intake. When you get down to this zone below about 5.8, the cows will often be in good shape for calcium, but you're also approaching this danger zone where cows can get over acidified. And when they get over acidified, they don't eat their dry matter. Their, their only response when they're over acidified, the only response they can make is to quit eating. So I believe that being in this zone as an average pH is probably a little bit too low. I'd rather see the urine pH here. It is true that if you can get the urine pH down around 5.7, 5.8, there's very little variation. All the cows will be down in this zone. That's partly because they really have trouble making more acidic urine than what they're already at. If you try to set your urine pH at 6.2, you're gonna find some cows up here at 6.8, some down here at 5.8. There's a lot more variability because small differences in feed intake greatly influence the urine pH. Down here, small differences in, your, in intake don't make much of a difference because the cow is on the verge of being over acidified. Collecting urine is everybody's favorite job. If you wanna collect urine successfully to test the pH, make sure you get a midstream sample, make sure it's reasonably clean. Um, there shouldn't be too much fecal matter in your, in your sample. It's a really good idea to wear gloves because leptospirosis does exist in this country. And if you have any kind of cut on your hand, you can develop leptospirosis. So wear gloves. It also makes your lunch taste better. Checking urine pH. Some farms have adopted a pH meter 
that's wonderful if they actually calibrate it routinely and maintain that machine. I found that's not always the easiest thing for farms to, to do. We like this pH ion strip. It's made for humans, it's cheap. Uh, each test is maybe 10 or 11 cents. They come in a little brown bottle, so they're tightly sealed, and that allows you to reuse those or open the bottle up time and time again. I don't like the pH paper rolls because they're great the first day you open them, but the next time you go to use them, they've been, they've been exposed to air unless you've tightly sealed them up, and that means your readings are not going to be quite accurate. How do I interpret that urine pH? Let's say I collected 10 samples. In scenario one, the average pH was 6.3. That's where we want you. Good shape, compensated metabolic acidosis. Scenario two, the average pH is 7.4. Well, you're starting to get them acidified, but I think you'd be happier if you got them a little more anion in there to try to bring that pH down just a little bit further. Scenario three, average pH is 5.2. These guys are over acidified. You need to back off on the anions. Scenario four is the tougher one to interpret. Farmers call me up and they say, I went out and checked my cows. I got four cows that are 5.2 this morning, six cows that are 7.8 this morning. What's happening here? How can this be? Well, there's three, three possible answers to this. One is the cows are sorting out the diet, especially with these high straw diets. If you don't have that straw chopped to about one inch length and you don't add some water to make it stick a little bit, sometimes the anions will be sorted out by the cows. Some cows get more of them than, the, than other cows do. Number two, overcrowding. Now, I know how rare that is on American dairies, but if it happens, sometimes that means some of the cows don't get in to eat the goodies right away and they uh, have to eat what's left over, which may or may not contain anionic salts. If you've eliminated sorting and you've eliminated overcrowding, you better think that you've got too much anion in the diet. What happens is these cows are currently over acidified. They'll probably not eat very well this morning. By this evening, they'll be eating well because their urine pH will be where these cows are this morning. These cows were probably over acidified last night. Their urine pH has recovered. Now they'll eat this morning, and by tonight, they'll be back down in the over acidified zone. So when you see this yo yoing of, PT, of urine pH values, start thinking that you over acidified the cows, and you need to back off a little bit on how much anion they're being fed. Let's look at magnesium now. I've kind of mentioned that we need a lot of magnesium in the diet, more than the old NRC probably would have said, and it must be very available for the cow to take advantage of it. We mentioned that magnesium atoms have to be sitting here in order for parathyroid hormone to do its thing on the bone and the kidney cells. Now, the strange thing about cows and all ruminants is that they only absorb magnesium across the rumen wall. They can't absorb it in their small intestine like every other species. Why that happened, I don't know. But it means that if we're going to feed them magnesium, that magnesium has to be soluble at rumen pH if it's going to become available. There's two transport systems in the rumen wall. The main transport system is very efficient at even low dietary magnesium concentration. But unfortunately, it's easily poisoned by diets that are high in potassium or non-protein nitrogen. The second system is a passive transport system. This one only works if I've got very high ionized magnesium in the rumen fluid to make it work, similar to calcium. A passive system means you have to have very high ionized magnesium or calcium levels to make it go across those intestinal cell barriers. To make this work, we're going to keep diet magnesium 0.4% prepartum and also in the early postpartum period to make sure that we can take advantage of passive transport of magnesium across the room and wall. We also have to make sure our magnesium source that we're using is available to the cow. 
It has to be very finely ground and not overly heat treated. Calcined is the word, heat treatment. We can test cows for hypomagnesemia. You can pull a blood sample from a cow within 12 hours of calving and her blood calcium or blood magnesium, I'm sorry, should be at least 1.9 milligrams per deciliter if she's in good shape. Less than 1.9 means you'll see secondary hypocalcemia. You may see depressed feed intake and depressed rumen fermentation. And certainly if it goes very low, you can actually see grass tetany type syndrome where the animal goes into the shakes uh, due to low blood magnesium. If we look at our magnesium sources, we're trying to feed these cows pre-calving, we're in good shape if we're using anions. Almost every commercial anion product now is adding magnesium, either in the form of magnesium sulfate or magnesium chloride. So they'll get plenty of soluble magnesium if you use one of the commercial anion sources prior to calving. The problem comes post-calving. After calving, nutritionists almost universally use magnesium oxide as the source of magnesium. That's great. Magnesium oxide can supply magnesium. And more importantly, in lactating cows, we have problems with rumen acidosis. Magnesium oxide is rumen alkalinizer. So feeding a good source of magnesium oxide can supply magnesium and also combat rumen acidosis. I threw in this other little sentence here, my experience, if you see mid-lactation milk fevers, cows that are 30 to 100 days in milk, and they go down and they respond to a bottle of calcium intravenously and get back up on their feet, chances are that diet was too low in magnesium. This is a fairly common occurrence in uh, lactating cow rations. All right, magnesium oxide is coming from all over the world these days to the United States. Um, some of it is good, some of it is very poor. You need to test to see if the mill that you're working with is using a good magnesium oxide. To test it, you can take three grams of magnesium oxide, put it into a test tube, add 40 mils of white vinegar. White vinegar you can get in any grocery store and it's 5% acetic acid. Cap the container and shake it pretty well. Let it sit for 30 minutes and check the pH. The vinegar has a pH 2.6 to 2.8. A good magnesium oxide will bring the pH well up over eight. The lousy ones, 3.8 to five. Now, remember pH is logarithmic scale. So let's say I am at uh, 4.2 with my magnesium oxide source. From 4.2 to 5.2, that's a change of one pH unit, but it represents a tenfold change in hydrogen ion binding. So 4.2 to 5.2, tenfold. 5.2 to 6.2 times 10, a hundredfold. 6.2 to 7.2 times 10, a thousandfold. 7.2 to 8.2 times 10, a ten thousandfold difference. And how well this is buffering the rumen, and that buffering capacity is well lined up with availability to the animal. So make sure we've got a good magnesium source. Another strategy that can be used is to reduce dietary calcium prior to calving, and this will stimulate the parathyroid gland to release that hormone for days before the cow actually calves, and even if she's on a high potassium diet, if I release parathyroid hormone for a week to 10 days before she actually calves, that will overcome that tissue resistance to parathyroid hormone stimulation induced by that high potassium diet. This is one of the original experiments uh, done. The Ohio State group did it as well, but this is done at Iowa State where uh, Howard Green fed one diet that had as little as eight grams of calcium per day the other diet had about 80 grams of calcium per day. This diet was about 0.6% calcium. This diet was about 0.1% or less than that calcium. When he feeds low calcium diet prior to calving, 
Sure enough, they show just very small drop in blood calcium, very quickly recover. Cows fed the adequate calcium diet, have a more severe drop in blood calcium, and it takes them a couple days to return to normal. Many of these cows actually got milk fever. They were older Jersey cows in this study. Well, unfortunately, feeding eight grams of calcium per day is very, very difficult. The diet that Howard Green formulated was one of these diets that you would not typically feed to dry cows. Fortunately, in the last few years, a product called Zeolite, Exolite is the commercial name, has become available. And this compound, it's an aluminosilicate granule um, that will bind calcium in the diet. And by binding it, it prevents that calcium from being absorbed. And so in essence, you can take a low calcium diet, 0.4 to 0. 7 maybe percent calcium, add zeolite, and it will make that diet act as if it had very little or calcium available, a calcium deficient diet, and do all the things that Howard Green did with his diet. Here's a study that was done at Cornell and published last year. They added half a kilogram of this zeolite aluminosilicate granules to the diet. And that diet was 0.65% calcium, 0.39% phosphorus, and 0.42% magnesium. Had a high DCAD. Here are the cows that got the zeolite. Their blood calcium concentration falls just a little bit, but they recover. Cows without the zeolite in their diet, and this 0.65% calcium diet, high DCAD, suffer more hypocalcemia, and eventually they return to normal. Just like Howard Green showed in the 1980s, this zeolite will prevent milk fever if you can get the cows on a reasonably low calcium diet. A couple of things that are disturbing about the use of zeolite, blood phosphorus levels in the cows fed zeolite are extremely low. So are blood magnesium levels. Ordinarily, I would have said this would maybe be a sign of problems, but when you read through the literature and the studies that have been done, the cows seem to bounce back on their magnesium, bounce back on their phosphorus, and there's no reported ill effects from this hypophosphatemia and hypomagnesemia that you see when this kind of a zeolite product is added to the diet. It likely binds the trace minerals as well, but hopefully cows have a store of trace minerals um, that they can rely on in the liver during this short period of time when you feed it for two to three weeks before calving. Another thing that zeolite does is it drops your dry matter intake, particularly in that last week before parturition. And this study, the Cornell study, the rumination rate was significantly decreased when uh, zeolite was fed prepartum. But the product is another option. If DCAD doesn't work for you, zeolite may be another option. Vitamin D administration. I'm gonna tell you right now that feeding vitamin D or administering it as an intramuscular injection is too dangerous. Oral calcium drenches, boluses, and gels, they come up next. If we look at what happens to a cow that's been given an oral or an intravenous dose of calcium, we see this kind of a picture. Now, this was disturbing to me because when I graduated from veterinary school, I was often recommending to clients that they take all their third lactation older cows and give them a bottle of calcium intravenously. Well, here's what happens when you do that. Yes, you get a nice initial rise in blood calcium concentration, and that first day of parturition, they look pretty good. But on day two and three after parturition, Blood calcium concentration in these cows that got the IV calcium is actually lower than in cows that I did nothing at all to. If I use the oral calcium boluses, I get a little bit of a rise in blood calcium, not very much, but it seems to be sustained and there's no rebound hypocalcemia like we see with the IV calcium. IV calcium, the blood calcium goes so high that we shut off all those calcium homeostatic mechanisms. And so on day two and three, she's got to restart all that calcium release from the bone 
intestinal calcium absorption. So we see some rebound hypocalcemia in cows that were given intravenous calcium that we seem to avoid when using the oral calcium boluses or gels or pastes. Those calcium boluses and gels and pastes, the amount of rise in calcium you're gonna see in the blood is pretty strictly related to how much calcium you put into those animals, how high you can get the calcium in the lumen of the gut. The more calcium in the lumen of the gut, the more of it gets absorbed. If I'm trying to make a oral bolus or a gel or a drench, I have to think about what my goals are and how I'm going to achieve it. So if my goal is to raise the blood calcium very quickly, provide some relief to this cow who's developing hypocalcemia, I want something that's gonna be really rapidly ionized. Calcium chloride is the main source of calcium used. It's also acidifying. Calcium propionate is fairly popular. The beauty of it is it supplies propionate, which helps the cow make glucose. Calcium formate, acetate, and lactate are sometimes used, but they tend to be more expensive, and only lactate is going to be helping the glucose situation out for the cow. If I want to supply magnesium to the cow, I've got to make sure the magnesium is soluble in the rumen so I can raise blood magnesium. Mag sulfate is one choice. Mag chloride, these are very good choices because they're also acidifying. The Celtic C magnesium carbonate tends to be reasonably available too. Not quite as good as mag chloride, but close. And magnesium oxide, if you get a very reactive magnesium oxide, it can be used for this purpose as well. If I'm trying to supply calcium or magnesium to the animal long term, after a passage through the abomasum, I can use calcium sulfate, calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate. Calcium sulfate might be a nice choice because it's also acidifying the cow um, as it gets released in the small intestine. If I'm using a drench, I have lots more options. I can put propylene glycol in, glycerin, propionate as an energy source. I can grind up some alfalfa or some soybean meal and put it into the animal and drench them with that. I can put electrolytes in. This cow just dropped a calf that weighs about 90 pounds, and she probably also dropped 90 to 110 pounds of fluid out of her uterus. That causes a little bit of an electrolyte imbalance. By adding some electrolytes to my drench, I can give her what she needs to allow her to reestablish her blood volume. I can put yeast in. I can put vitamins in. All kinds of other little choices with a drench. If we look at those oral calcium boluses, they've become very popular, much more popular than the drench because nobody likes drenching cows. It's a royal pain in the neck because it takes time and a lot more labor. The boluses get used. That's the beauty of them. They may not be as effective as the drenches, but they certainly are easy to administer. And if it's easy to administer, it will actually get done. They contain somewhere between 30 and 50 grams of calcium, depending on the product. Most of that calcium is in the form of calcium chloride if it's to be an effective bolus. They raise the blood calcium only a small amount, maybe 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams per deciliter, and it only holds it for three to six hours maybe after administration. It does supply chloride, which is acidifying, and that may be a major mode of action of these boluses to keep this cow on an anion load the first day after calving. And that will help increase tissue parathyroid hormone responsiveness. This is a nice study done by Katrina Roberts in New Zealand. Um, they gave two boluses to cows, one right after they calved and another one 12 hours after the first bolus. She checked their urine pH and 12 hours after calving, after that first bolus was given, five out of the 13 treated cows had a urine pH below seven none of the control cows. With the second bolus, she checked their urine pH 24 hours, 13 out of 13 had low urine pH, none of the control cows again. This suggests that part of the mechanism of action of those boluses is to keep this cow acidified so that she can respond to parathyroid hormone better. 
Ian Lane did a study, a, l- a little meta-analysis looking at hypocalcemia prevention, and this one focused on using anions. And in this study, he looked at studies that where the anions had been fed for at least 21 days, and they had collected milk production records for at least the first two months of lactation. What he found was that cows that were fed anions produced an average of two and a half pounds more fat-corrected milk every day for the first 65 days in lactation. That'd be about 161 pounds. If you extrapolate that to the whole lactation, that's about 752 pounds, very close to what Dave Beatty saw in his study where he had about 720 pounds more milk made during that lactation when cows were fed anions. Elliot Block did a study where he found 1,100 pounds more milk in cows who were fed anionic diets. So what's my return on investment if I prevent milk fever? If milk is selling for about $18 per 100 pounds right now, I've got milk selling for 18 cents a pound times 752 pounds and 305 day lactation. I'm gonna make about $135 from the milk produced by using anionic salts. What will I pay for those anionic salts? I can do the traditional anionic salts, keeping in mind that I might have some palatability issues, I can do that for $9, maybe as much as $13 per cow, feeding it for 21 days. I can use the commercial anion supplements that are on the market. Typically, they're around $18 per cow. Some areas of the country, maybe as much as $22 per cow. You're still going to get at least a 5 to 1 return on your investment. If I use the Zeolite program, it's $2 to $2.50 per day. You're supposed to feed it for 14 days. You've got $28 in this product, um, you're still making a lot of money by using that product. You can add an oral calcium gel or bolus to your program. Let's say it's $4 for the gels, $7 for the boluses, times two, that's $14. Add that together, you're still at least at a three to one return on investment just from milk sales. And we haven't even figured in how much money you might possibly save by preventing milk fever and hypocalcemia and what it does to ketosis. Your mastitis cases, particularly coliform mastitis, is greatly increased in hypocalcemic cows. You reduce your retained placenta. I haven't even figured in displaced abomasum. You improved uterine health. How much is this worth to you? Figure that in, and there's no doubt that preventing, spending some money on preventing hypocalcemia is well worth the expense. I'm throwing this slide in to show what happens with rumination patterns because rumination monitoring has become kind of a a neat tool that's on a lot of dairies nowadays. The purple line here represents cows who are fed an anionic diet. The green line and the red line are cows who are fed a higher DCAD diet, no anions added. Some of those cows on the high DCAD diet did not get milk fever they still get hypocalcemia. The cows, some of those cows on the high DCAD diet actually got milk fever. And you can see that their blood calcium stays low for at least a couple of days into lactation. Milk fever cows really don't respond until two to three days into lactation. Look at rumination patterns. All cows show a drop in rumination as they deliver a calf, probably they're distracted from ruminating while they're actually delivering that 90 pound object through their pelvis. That is the drop you see from the act of parturition. Cows will then start to recover. If they're on an anionic diet, they recover by about the second day of of, uh, lactation quite nicely. If they're on a cation diet and they have this subclinical hypocalcemia, it takes a little longer for them to reach what we're gonna call normal levels of rumination. If they've actually developed milk fever, it takes three to four days before their blood, before their rumination pattern approaches what we would say was a normal rumination pattern. And it's very strictly controlled with hypocalcemia. The lower the blood calcium, the less rumination. And it's a very high correlation between blood calcium concentration and rumination pattern. 
we had thought perhaps we could use rumination to predict hypocalcemia, but in fact, it turns out the other way around. Hypocalcemia predicts rumination rate. For ketosis, displacement of the abomasum, these rumination rates fall one day or so before the veterinarian can diagnose those diseases. In this case, hypocalcemia actually dictates rumination pattern. I'm gonna end with this study. This is a study done by Jessica McCart, and many veterinarians are worried about taking blood samples, and nutritionists wanna know if we should take blood samples to assess whether or not the cows have hypocalcemia, and if my DCAD program or zeolite program or whichever program you've chosen is working well. What Jessica showed on a single dairy was that there's some cows that go through the calving process and they don't suffer any kind of hypocalcemia other than this small little blip right at calving, and then they get to normal blood calcium levels very, very quickly. She called these normal calcemic cows, all of them above, above 2.0 millimolar, which is equivalent to 8 milligrams per deciliter. She had some cows that developed this transient hypocalcemia, where they're definitely hypocalcemic, but by day two, they've bounced back to normal. So she calls this a transient hypocalcemia. A third group developed this hypocalcemia, but it takes them three to four days before they come back to normal blood calcium concentrations, maybe even six to seven days in some of these cows. She called this a persistent hypocalcemia. And then she has another group of cows here, a small group, that develops what she calls delayed hypocalcemia. They're okay on day one, but thereafter they have more hypocalcemia on days three, four, and five. Now the take home message to me came from her analysis of milk production. These cows that suffered a transient hypocalcemia actually were out producing the cows who had just this small drop in blood calcium on day one. So remember the calcium dynamics, the more milk you make, the bigger the strain on the system for calcium, and it might be that you'll see more hypocalcemia on day one. The key is whether or not these cows come back to normal very quickly. It's the persistent hypocalcemia that seems to end up with cows that are sick. In Jessica's study, these cows were much more likely to be culled if they had this persistent or delayed hypocalcemia. So that means it's very difficult sometimes to say that your program is working or not working by looking at day one blood calcium concentrations. It may be more critical to look on day two when the anionic diet cows will return to normal very quickly. Cows on cationic diets or high DCAD diets tend not to return so quickly. And I think that's all I have for today. Um, hopefully some questions will come up about what I've talked about. Thank you very much for your attention. Before we introduce next month's speaker and thank our co-hosts and sponsors, I want to tell you of a short webinar series we are doing partnering with the Canola Council of Canada. We will be bringing a three-part webinar series highlighting new research findings and the practical application of these findings in dairy feed formulation. The first webinar will feature dairy consultant Daniel Scothorn of Scothorn Nutrition, an internationally recognized dairy nutritionist. Daniel is a graduate of Tallahassee University and the University of Saskatchewan. He will address his views on nutritional consulting, ration formulation, and meeting nutrient requirements, as well as his experience with canola meal. If any of you follow him on LinkedIn, and you should, you know he's a fantastic nutritionist who takes a very practical approach to nutrition management. The webinar is sponsored by the Canola Council of Canada in conjunction with the AMTS The Nutritionist webinar series. Daniel will be interviewed by Dr. Essie Evans, followed by a Q&A with the audience. It will take place at 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on March 31st. More information and how to sign up can be found on the AMTS upcoming events page. 
Next month, on April 9th, we'll be joined by Dr. Frank Mittler of the University of California, Davis, where he is a professor in animal science and air quality specialist. Frank is frequently sought after for his expertise and ability to bring stakeholders together to address issues regarding air quality and agricultural efficiencies and sustainability. His work in this regards has included serving as chairman of a global United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, partnership project to benchmark the environmental footprint of livestock production. He was a work group member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST, under President Barack Obama, and a member of the National Academies of Science Institute of Medicine, IOM, committee on a framework for assessing the health, environmental, and social effects of the food system. You can find him on Twitter at GHGGuru. We are honored to have him join us next month when his topic will be the 2050 Challenge, Feeding the Planet Without Wasting It. As with this webinar, there will be two opportunities to join. Our times will be 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time and 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on April 9th. Finally, before we get to the questions, I want to thank my co-hosts and my sponsors. The webinars are organized and produced by AMTS USA and Global. Our longtime collaborator is Paula Torillo of Afinas, who hosts the series as El Webinar du del Nutritionista, and she joins us in the afternoon webinar. She receives support from Guermo Lerman, Technal, Rock River Lab in Argentina, Biotur, and Conicar. She has the excellent translation skills of Paula Elanis backing her up. We also thank AMTS distributors in Italy, Elena Bonfante of Dairy Innovations Italia, who unfortunately was not able to join us this time. In China, Sean Lee of Ansi Tech, who joined us in the morning and the afternoon. And in Russia, Vadim Bekchepnikov of Nobelab, who joined us in the afternoon webinars. We are especially thankful to generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsors, Arm & Hammer Animal Health, makers of cattle feed ingredients that optimize dairy cow health, and the Canola Council of Canada. Learn more about feeding canola at canolamazing.com. Our silver sponsors are Ejinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition Through Amino Acids, makers of Agipro L, Dairyland Laboratories, and Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA, Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s. Our bronze sponsors are Dairy One Forage Laboratory, Amino Max, Adiseo, Purdue Agribusiness, PMI, and Soychlor. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide. We hope that you will consider them in your formulation decisions. I will now open the floor up for questions. The English language listeners, I will read your question. Remember to type it in the Q&A tab or the chat window. I'm going to start with some questions that we have in the Q&A with window and i know that some of these were answered in during the course of the the presentation but it wouldn't hurt to reiterate them so the first one is um what is the mechanism by which anions reduce ph is it anion exchange with bicarbonate across the lower um g gi g, g <laughs> gastrointestinal wall well uh, no. <laughs> and Jesse, let me know. I'm going to make it so that you can see if you want me to go to a certain slide. Yeah, for this one, uh, I don't have any slide prepared. Um, the whole DCAD theory is part of uh, something called the strong ion difference theory. It's a little bit different than what we were taught in school, um, where the world revolved around bicarbonate anion. In the DCAD theory, the strong ion difference theory, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, these are positively charged. And the more positive the blood, the more alkaline the blood. Anions, negatively charged particles, as you raise those in the blood, the blood becomes more acidic. That's, that's a 30-second answer to a, a question. It really takes two or three hours to to explain. Um, you have to give up the notion that the world revolves around bicarbonate. 
that, that work good for explaining respiratory alkalosis, respiratory acidosis. When it comes to metabolic acidosis and alkalosis, it, it's difficult to understand that through bicarbonate. More positive charges absorbed, more alkaline. More negative charges absorbed into the blood, the more acidic the blood. And if, if you'd like more information on that, um, there are a couple of articles. I, I actually wrote one in a mineral review in the Journal of Dairy Science that has like two or three pages devoted to how this all works on a, on a molecular basis. But I, I think for this webinar, I'm just going to leave it simple that cations alkalinize, anions absorbed, acidify. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Um, I'm going to keep asking a few questions and then I'll sure. let Sean. Um, I have a fairly long question and I typed that into the chat for you, Jesse, so that you could see it because it's, it's fairly detailed, lots of numbers, and it might help you to form your answer um, by actually seeing it. It's that first question. Um, from the literature, it comes it is, um, indicates that milk fever incidence rate is higher when dietary calcium is more than 0.5 or less than 2% of the dry matter, in, of dry matter and cows receive anionic diets with recommended levels of vitamin D, cholecalciferol from the NRC 2001. Right. Um, the, the questioner says, I'm not sure why for some, um, not sure why somebody is recommended to balance diets for calcium at 1.4 to 1.5% of dry matter when fed anionic diets. Um, any justification for other minerals like um, potassium, magnesium, et cetera, when our dietary level of calcium is lower, um, less than or equal to point five percent or upper greater than or equal to two percent limit increasing milk fever incidence rate especially when dietary calcium level is higher than two percent of dry matter which may have beneficial reproductive performance as is recently shown or even when it is between 1.4 to 1.5 phew that's a mouthful hopefully you can suss that out and and explain it as you answer yeah i i get asked this all the time. Um, realize I'm giving you my view. Um, I'm not sure everybody agrees with me. The meta-analyses that you have mentioned, there's like three or four of them now that are out there, and they're not always in agreement on where the dietary calcium level should be. Um, you'll find some that say 1% calcium is the worst. You'll see some that say... Uh, 1% calcium is pretty good for these diets. I am not a meta-analysis guy. Uh, I'm an experimentalist. We have looked at 0.5% calcium versus 1.5% calcium. We've looked at 0.5 versus 0.75. So long as the cows are equally acidified, you will get the same response in blood calcium. Now, there's, a, there's two or th other, three other things that have to be kept in mind. If you're going to raise the diet calcium to, say, 1.5%, as some nutritionists suggest, or even go to 2%, which is, I think, a little crazy, but let's say you go that high, you are going to resort to adding limestone to the cow's diet, calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is alkalinizing. When you feed it, you're going to have to feed more anions to achieve the same urine or blood pH. It's just, just the way it goes. So if you insist on going to these higher calcium diets, be prepared to buy a little bit more anion to counteract that limestone. Um, and that's okay. It, it probably works. The second issue is when you get to adding that much limestone to a diet, Dave Beatty showed nicely that once you get to about 1.5% calcium, dry matter intake starts dropping. It's just a lot of rocks to add to the diet. Um, 
then the issue of reproduction. Um, I know I know the Illinois paper has gotten a lot of people thinking that they should add calcium to their diet. I don't know exactly why that response happened in that experiment. I have a conjecture. The animals in that experiment were fed a fairly heavy anion load. Their urine pH is down around 5.8, if I recall. There can be a cows with an average of 5.8. If you actually, Marianne, can I go back to the slide that has that urine titration curve? It's about, keep going up. It is that one with the, yeah, little titration curve. If you look down around minus 200 to about minus 150, those animals will all have urine pHs that are probably considered good by some nutritionists, 5.5 to 5.8. But some of the cows will be probably in an over-acidified state. If you add calcium carbonate to that diet, you will move the cows slightly to the right. They'll be a little less alkaline uh, or a little less acidic, more, more alkaline. So you may be saving cows that were in an uncompensated metabolic acidosis and pushing them to a compensated metabolic acidosis with the addition of limestone at those levels to the diet. That, that may be part of the explanation for why the cows did better on the higher calcium diet. I, I, I know that I'm out there in left field when I say that urine pH should only be around 6.2. Um, I know that metabolic alkalosis causes milk fever. I don't know that I have to push them to the extreme on the other end of metabolic acidosis to prevent milk fever. I just need to remove them from a state of metabolic alkalosis. I, adding limestone may alkalinize cows that are, have a urine pH of 5.8, 5.5, bring them to a state of compensated acidosis as opposed to uncompensated acidosis. You can see that it, on that graph, anywhere from minus 200 down to minus 400, the urine pHs don't change much. You've, you've reached the limit. In fact, the original paper by uh, Peter Constable's group shows that urine pH actually starts going up a little bit when they're at minus 400. It's basically because they go off feed and uh, quit eating the anion diets. Um, I, I hope that's a reasonable answer for this. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to pull up some of the questions that are somewhat related to that. Um, so this is, uh, researchers from Wisconsin have investigated whether high calcium concentrates above 2% during the dry period are beneficial. Unfortunately, non-lactating, non-pregnant cows were used there. What is your general assessment of the benefits of high calcium supply during the close-up period? Um, and sorry, I know we're going to be going over some things multiple times. That's, that's fine. You know, uh, this, uh, Dave Beatty and I had this conversation many years ago. If we could take advantage of this passive absorption of calcium with the drenches and the boluses, why can't I do that with the diet? Why can't I put calcium in the diet up high enough that I can force passive absorption? Um, it just, we, we, we went up as high as 2% calcium. I think Dave might've gone even a little bit higher. You get some increase in calcium absorbed by that route, but it's not enough to counteract these uh, homeostasis challenges that these cows have right at the time of calving. Um, it's a great idea, it sounds good, but it, it just hasn't been practical. The other thing you have to worry about is that when you're feeding these cows these high calcium diets, again, you're adding limestone, and again, there's a point where it decreases dry matter intake. So we've been focused on milk fever, but if you wanna cause ketosis in cows or get them to have a displaced abomasum, 
decrease their dry matter intake just before they calve. So that's probably why that approach hasn't worked so well. Maybe it will, but maybe the Wisconsin people will get it to go, but we, we can't get it to go. Okay. I'm going to switch a little bit from calcium discussion to um, some about vitamin D. We have a number of, I'll do a quick one though, that, that seems like it's, it's make, making a good transition. What is the recommended frequency to monitor urine pH? Oh boy. Um, on most dairies, once a week, if they're a large enough dairy, it'd be fine. Every couple of weeks for the smaller dairies, because forages are not changing all that much, would be fine. What happens is a lot of people will do this diligently when they first start the anion program, and they'll kind of let it slide a little bit as time goes on until they have a, a problem. And usually the problem is caused by a change in forages. Um, the other issue that always comes up is what time of day should I do this? Research would show there's minor differences that we can show statistically in a research setting. Don't worry about it on farm. The main idea is to just get it done when it's most convenient and start keeping track on a farm. I really like urine pH testing because it's cheap. It's relatively simple, but I understand the resistance to it. I also understand that people get comfortable with their DCAD program. And this, this again may be why if you're going to feed for a urine pH of about 6.2, if you have a few little changes, it's not going to move you too far either direction to the point where you're entering uncompensated acidosis or getting the other way and getting into an area where you're no longer effective. But if you're down here around 5.2, six, 5.8, and there's a change in the forages, you're, you're, you can have big problems if all of a sudden diet potassium dropped and you're adding the same amount of anion. So if you're going to play down in the 5.8 zone, you probably should check urine pHs at least once a week. If you're going to settle for 6.2, 6.5, um, every couple of weeks, maybe once a month if you're a smaller dairy, but checking urine pH keeps you out of trouble. Okay, thank you. While we're discussing fluids, um, I have a question from a, uh, a listener. He says the local vet is always wanting to do blood work on cows that are down with milk fever. And not surprisingly, the numbers are always low. Does this practice make any sense? Um, why would you just not go ahead and treat? Or is there something else that they're looking for that he's missing? Well, speaking of my brethren, I don't want to knock my veterinary colleagues, but um, I like the idea of pulling a blood sample from a cow who is down, but then I'll go ahead and treat her right after I've pulled the blood sample. The reason for pulling that blood sample is several fold. Um, number one, does she really have milk fever? Her calcium should be well below five if she's down. Does she have hypomagnesemia as well? Because normally if she's got milk fever and her diet magnesium is good, her blood magnesium levels will be actually higher than normal. If she's lower than normal, that suggests that your diet magnesium is part of the reason why that cow gets milk fever. Even if you had her properly acidified, if her blood magnesium falls because the diet magnesium is unabsorbable, or insufficient, you will see that in that blood sample. So I like to check that at the same time. Now I live up here in Iowa. Um, it's springtime. It still gets cold nights here. This is a time of year and it's been, been going on for about a month where we would traditionally see these hypophosphatemic downer cows. These cows have low blood phosphorus, very low blood phosphorus. It's not unusual for cows who normally have blood magnesium between four and six milligrams per deciliter to fall into the area of two and a half to three as a result of hypocalcemia. But if they fall below one milligram per deciliter, we can actually see a hypophosphatemic downer cow. It, it appears that it's low blood phosphorus that keeps these cows from rising to their feet. You can treat them for milk fever, but they still 
fail to stand up unless you properly treat them with a phosphate source. Um, so those are some reasons why you may want to check the pH or check the elements, the mineral content of, of a cow just before you treat her. Okay, I'm, I'm sure that'll be a very helpful answer. Um, Sean, I have been a uh, question hog. Do you want to answer some, ask some questions and then I'll go back? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Professor Goff, it's an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, as I mentioned in my email, I also uh, translated that in Chinese and broadcasted that um, today before yesterday. We had about 180 uh, nutritionists online. Wow. In, all of them are Chinese. So um, I, th this is a very good presentation and uh, guys uh, are very happy um, about that. After the presentation, they, on, they asked a lot of questions. I did my best to answer some basic questions and there are still a few left. Uh, I would like to ask you for help. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the first one is, um, what's the pathological cause of a persistent uh, hypocalcemia? Um, and what, what can a dairy veterinary do about that? Um, one large, actually the largest dairy in China, um, a nutritionist asked this question. They, they, had a, they have this problem. Yeah, that, there, there are several things that can be doing this. In the old days, uh, before anionic salt programs, it wasn't unusual for a cow to get milk fever. Treat her as a veterinarian. You would treat the cow with intravenous calcium. She would get to her feet. She looked okay. And then the next day, she'd have milk fever again. And some of these cows would go on like this for two or three days where they had to be treated for milk fever every 24 hours or so. That relapsing milk fever seemed to be associated with several different things. Number one, high potassium diets. It appeared that these animals were still alkalotic even after calving, and it took several days before they finally had enough parathyroid hormone hitting their system to turn on the bone and get the bone to release calcium. Um, that's one of them. I think what Jessica McCart saw, though, was probably not quite the same thing. Um, that persistent hypocalcemia that she sees, I don't know that we have a good handle, a good idea of why that occurs in some cows within the same herd that are fed the same diet. Certainly age is a factor. Older cows respond more slowly. There are some other things that can affect these cows endotoxins may be one. And uh, certainly Lance Baumgard and, and uh, Bareem Amitage have been hammering this idea of that perhaps endotoxins are being released from the gut and are affecting calcium metabolism of these cows. And typically endotoxic type shock will only drop blood calcium into the area of six to seven milligrams per deciliter. So that would be about uh, 1.5 to 1.75 uh, millimolar. That doesn't necessarily put a cow down. It doesn't make her recumbent, but it slows her whole metabolic system. And uh, endotoxins, either coming from the gut, from concurrent mastitis, or perhaps more frequently, metritis, those may be partially to blame for the persistent hypocalcemia. But I, beyond that, I'm, well, I'm already speculating. I'm, I'm probably shouldn't say any more than that. Okay, thank you. Um, the second one is that for, for monitoring hypocalcemia, which one is better to measure? Plasma, ionized, uh, calcium or total blood calcium. Uh, on farm, you know, the eye stat from, from now it maybe is um, Zoetis and uh, Horiba, that's little meter. Mm -hmm. Both of them measuring, uh, measure ion, ion, ionized calcium. Right. 
Uh, if ionized calcium is measured, um, what's the cutoff point and uh, what, when is the best time to collect samples? Well, ionized calcium is theoretically the calcium that matters in a cow's blood. That's the biologically active fraction that's in a cow's blood. So if you look at total calcium in a blood bloodstream of a cow, and I'll, I'll go to millim, millimolar here, it should be somewhere between 2 to 2.5 millimolar total calcium. Half of that should be ionized. Now, it turns out in cattle that number is actually about 45% of the calcium is in the ionized form. So you should expect to see ionized calcium of between 0 0.9 and about, uh, oh, I got to do the math here in my head. Uh, 1.2. 1 yeah. Uh, millim millimolar ionized. Okay. So that's where it should be. Uh, when you look at the milk fever type situation, it's going to be well below 0 0.5 uh, millimolar ionized. Mm -hmm. uh, where do we get concerned for this subclinical? Probably it would be about the area of about 1 or 0 0.9 millimolar ionized would be the kind of the cutoff that's equivalent to what we have for total. Ionized calcium is a wonderful tool the, the you can take that to the farm and run it cow side. Um, it's going to cost, I don't know what it costs you in China, but for us, it's probably $2 and 50 cents minimum um, for those strips. And I've seen farms that are, we're getting charged a lot more than that. Um, total calcium is relatively cheap to run. If you want to know the if you value right away before you treat the cow, you need to use the ionized meters. If you're willing to wait until you can get back to the laboratory, you can usually run total calcium cheaper, and uh, it's it's you're going you'll get the answer later. Okay, thank you. Um, the last one is uh, one of my listeners asked about. Um, Jersey heifers, um, they also have quite a high uh, hypocalcemia on their Jersey heifers. So what did, did they do wrong um, <laughs> in his can and uh, so to help this heifer? So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm actually surprised that you're seeing and, and, and maybe I need to ask you to define hypocalcemia in these heifers. You're not actually seeing milk fevers in Jersey heifers, are you? I think it's milk fevers. These guys are not measuring uh, the blood calcium that frequently. So I believe they're saying about milk fevers. Cows, first, heifers, uh, you know, after calving that down, they, they cannot get up. Their very first calf, the yeah. Jerseys are getting milk fever. Yeah. Um, well, maybe they should take some blood samples because it may be some other complicated problem. Um, I don't know what all the treatments are that are in, in China, but we used to use uh, certain corticosteroids here in the United States on fresh cows, and we had a huge problem with heifers going down as a result of low blood potassium. Mm -hmm. hypokalemia and uh, that's my experience with heifers going down we can have hypomagnesemia causing tetany in heifers but you would have to drop their blood magnesium quite low to get that milk fever in a heifer I have I think I've seen two heifers that I knew had milk fever one was a Jersey and one was a Holstein um, it's just not something we see. So be sure you rule out the idea that these guys are maybe giving a drug like Pred-F or Asium or giving repeated doses of corticosteroids that also have some mineralocorticoid activity. That, that will cause heifers problems. Okay. Other than that, check the heifers for mastitis and metritis. Uh, mastitis especially coliform mastitis, 
can cause a cow to go down. It is not, it is not milk fever. It's, it's endotoxic shock. Mm, yeah. Do these, do these heifers respond to the IV calcium? Uh, I did not ask. Okay. I, I, I will. I will. Okay. Yeah. Well, you have my email, so you can email me a question later if you wish. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, forgive me. There is one more question. Yeah. Is it possible to feed the cows um, calcitriol? I'm not sure if my pronunciation yes. is right. The active form of vitamin D. One guy right. came up with this uh, smart idea. Uh, well, number, number one, it's illegal, at least here in the United States. Okay. But... I did a lot of it. That was my whole PhD thesis was given calcitriol to cows and it, and it will prevent milk fever if you time it correctly. And that's been the whole issue with it and why the FDA has not approved it. Um, if you give it too soon before the cow calves, it won't work. If you give it and she calves right away, it generally will not work. Um, the sweet spot is you have to give it between three and say six days before the cow calves. If you miss that window, you'd have to repeat the treatment or you have to deal with a cow who has a persistent uh, hypocalcemia because you have shut off all the endocrine systems that normally control calcium metabolism. Sort of like that IV calcium experiment Mm -hmm. You will shut off all the calcium homeostasis mechanisms and the cow will have a tough time um, restoring those if you miss the, miss the correct date for giving the, the 125 vitamin D. Now, there's some interesting work being done by Corwin Nelson and Jose Santos down at Florida where they're giving calcitriol to cows. Um, they seem to get this to work a little bit better than a lot of other people have in the past. Um, they also combine this with an anionic diet, and that may have been one of the reasons why it worked so well for them. Calcid calcidiol, 25-hydroxyvitamin D, is legal, and it's being used, but... All the research I've seen shows that it has no effect on the incidence of milk fever or the incidence of subclinical hypocalcemia. Okay. Thank you okay. so much. Um, Sean, thank you for those questions. Yep. Jess Jesse, I have a semi-related question and then I'll ask a bunch of questions about vitamin D. Um, I, you know, I grew up with jerseys and of course they're the best cows in the world. Um, why is it that Jersey seemed to struggle so much with milk fever or is it that, you know, 40 years ago, my family wasn't terribly good at feeding a, a good diet to those dry cows? Yeah, there's, there's a reason we always use jerseys out at our lab to study milk fever because they all got milk fever, um, as older cows. It was, it was, uh, that was always a question I want to know the answer to, too. <laughs> yeah, if she I, didn't get milk fever, she wasn't working hard enough. <laughs> right, right. And uh, so there's a couple things that are different about jerseys. Their colostrum has higher calcium content than a Holstein colostrum, but they make less of it. And so when you look on a per body weight basis, the jersey loses just a little bit more calcium than a Holstein. Not, not a terribly large difference in how much calcium is lost um, from the body that first day of lactation. One of the things we did see in jerseys was they have fewer vitamin D receptors in their intestine than does the Holstein. It was about a 15% difference. I did, you know, we did that work. We never got it published. We have an abstract on it. Um, it never seemed like 15% was a big enough difference to cause that much change in why Jersey's got more milk fever. I, so the short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> um, we, 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 we did try to look at it, but I, I can't tell you whether you ever nailed it down as to why the Jersey's had more milk fever. 
Yeah, in, interesting. Um, let's see, going back to some of the questions that um, our, our attendees are asking. So in Brazil, most of the milk production is based on grazing and their forages have high potassium content. Yeah. Um, should they use an ionic diet in that case? Um, what should be done or should they focus only on low calcium? Well, Brazil, Brazil has a couple of things that are different. Um, they're mostly doing temperate, uh, cool season grass grazing uh, mixed with some tropical grasses. Our experience is that it's pretty hard to keep potassium low in those diets. So you will probably never be able to take these cows from a urine pH of eight and a half down to 6.2. You're, you're, you're never going to be able to get those cows to eat enough anion. Couple that with the fact that these animals may be brought in once a day and given some grain or given the opportunity to get some grain. Um, that also makes it very difficult to get enough anions into them. What we have tried, and this was done in Costa Rica with my good friend Jorge Sanchez, who's no longer with us, um, we tried giving a anion product to pastured cows, bring them in once a day, give this in about a three or four pound package, let the cows eat it, and it had some anions in it, and it also was very high in magnesium. And we put no calcium in that product. So it was a trying to make a lower calcium, higher magnesium, somewhat acidified, very marginally acidified diet. And it had some benefits. We couldn't, we couldn't eliminate milk fever the way we can in the United States, but we greatly reduced the incidence of milk fever by doing that. It was not a simple solution. The pasture philosophy is not to give cows, not to put any money into these cows in terms of supplements. But in this case, the, at least in Costa Rica, they felt that they could justify bringing cows in and giving them a supplement like this. Um, there are other reasons why you may want to supplement these cows too for a little extra protein, metabolizable protein, things like that just before they calve. But that's what we did in the pasture setting there. Other than that, you've got to start choosing forages for those cows. And for instance, if you tr decide to make a lower calcium diet, oh boy, now, now I'm testing my memory. Um, African star thistle, if I recall, was a lower calcium than kukuyu grass. Mm -hmm. And uh, those choices of pasture for close-up dry cows would be important to make. If you're trying to make a lower potassium diet, then you stick with more of the traditional uh, tropical grasses that are C4 warm season grasses because they tend to have lower potassium. They're also very highly indigestible in those tropical regions. So getting the cows to eat them and maintain body weight becomes a challenge too. I, I don't have a, um, that's, that's it. I, I don't have a simple solution for the okay. pasture settings. I, I would not be surprised if we have a lot of questions this afternoon. Um, I'm assuming Argentina has some similar mm -hmm. type systems to Brazil. Um, I'm, I'm, I may be in trouble for saying that. No, it's okay. I'm, yeah. We'll see how they come out. Yes. Um, so I have a couple questions about um, vitamin D. Some of them you've answered, but we'll go over them again. Um, so in the case, um, if, if you use, and I'm going to just say the, the, the letters, um, 25-OH-D3 or 125-OH-2-D3 as vitamin D sources, um, are there updated, updated recommendations for adjusting minerals, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and so on, when anionic diets are fed? Does that okay. make sense? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, um, that product has been used in, in uh, poultry now for a number of years in the United States. 
It's been used in swine in, in Europe. I'm not sure how much of it's used here in the United States for swine. That product has a pretty good track record in poultry of increasing eggshell thickness, leg bone density and strength. In swine, it looks like it's helping with uh, the uh, leg strength of, of piglets as well. Those species sometimes have issues with vitamin D absorption. 25-hydroxy um, vitamin D is absorbed by two different mechanisms. So it may be that that spares these animals uh, going vitamin D deficient when they are challenged with something like diarrhea or, or other in gastrointestinal problems. In the cow, 25-hydroxy vitamin D is better absorbed than vitamin D3. That, no, doubt, no doubt about that. But there's very little evidence that we cannot make a cow who lives a long time compared to a chicken or a, or a market pig uh, that we have problems with vitamin D deficiency. Typically, feeding them 25 to 40,000 units of vitamin D per day this is cola calciferol now. Mm -hmm. That will be quite adequate, and they'll get good 25-hydroxy D levels in their blood. Feeding high, this they call it high D, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, was thought that maybe you could prevent milk fever feeding this, but at least three or four trials have been done, and there's no effect on calcium homeostasis. Now, again, this research at Florida is going to be interesting. Um, read some of the papers that Corwin Nelson has put out, and it may be stimulatory to the immune system. It may be helping milk production. But as far as calcium homeostasis goes, it really doesn't help them at all. A 125 vitamin D is, like I said, not legal in the United States right now. But it, it will greatly affect calcium metabolism, can be used to prevent milk fever. Years ago in Canada, it was legal to feed one alpha uh, cholecalciferol, which would be converted by the body to the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, and it worked, but you still had to get the timing just right. In Israel, it was used. It worked great, but if you didn't give it at the right time, the cows got milk fever anyway. So it became a timing issue. And it's very hard to say when a cow is one day away from calving versus four days away from calving. Okay. Yeah, great. And th this was asked from a country not in the U.S. Okay. Um, let's see. Where else did I not cover? Um, what is your opinion of high D? Well, as far as calcium homeostasis goes, it's not going to prevent milk fever or subclinical hypocalcemia. There's some talk that it may increase bone density, particularly of the older cow, and that may help her, but that remains speculation. Um, like I said, the Florida folks... They're suggesting that perhaps we'll get more milk from these cows and perhaps the immune system is improved when we feed high D compared to just regular vitamin D. So to me, the jury's still out. Um, I won't use it to, to try to improve the hypocalcemia milk fever situation, but if the evidence is there, maybe high D will be useful for the entire lactation if it improves milk production or, or uh, immune status of the animals. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have, can you recommend, and this may too, be too broad a question, an ideal level of vitamin D pre-calving? Um, the NRC says these cows should get by with about 20,000 units of vitamin D per day. Um, that's where the research shows almost every farm feeds well above that level. Typically, I'll see on farms anywhere from 30 to 50,000 units per day. It's probably excessive if you go above 75 or 80,000 units per day, but cows can tolerate quite a bit of vitamin D. Um, 
it would be just a waste of money to go much above 30, 35,000 units per day. And yet almost everybody feeds at least that much, if not more. It's cheap. Okay. Um, during the dry period, would you recommend a low calcium diet, even when there's a low DCAD diet applied? And this is, I, um, the, this was a question from Italy and this is where one, there is one dry cow group. So not, yeah. not two groups. Well, uh, here's the, okay, let's, my answer, particularly if you're only going to do a 21 day, uh, close up group is that combining low calcium with the DCAD, uh, no problem. Um, maybe it'll even work a little bit better, but uh, the research isn't very clear on that. It, there's certainly no, no issues with uh, somewhere between 0.4% calcium compared to anything higher. As long as they're acidified equally, you'll, be, you'll see the same response in blood calcium. Now, if you're trying to go down to about 0.2% calcium, really try to make a low calcium diet or maybe combining zeolite with the anions, those experiments really haven't been done. Um, one of the things to be concerned about is anionic diets increase the amount of calcium lost out in the urine every day, maybe as much as 5 to 12 grams of calcium per day is lost in the urine, depending on how acidified the cow is. Now over a 60 day, let's say 50 day dry period times, let's say six grams of calcium lost in the urine, that'd be 300 grams of calcium lost from the skeleton. Is that a big deal? Maybe, maybe not. Um, if you combine it with a low calcium diet, maybe that's more of a concern than it would be if they're fed a moderate calcium diet. I, I just don't know the answer. Uh, I have often thought that there might be some benefit to having a lower calcium diet, like 0.4, 0.5% calcium, just because the amount of anion needed to acidify that cow is reduced, makes it more palatable. Okay. So maybe, maybe not the answer they're hoping for, but that's, right, right. that's no, the I, best I, we've got. <laughs> Good. No, it's, it, this was a question from, um, from Elena. And I have just one or two other questions, I think. And, and there were some that I had that I will ask tonight too. So um, let's see. How do you explain that lactating cows do not normally have issues with um, calcium homeostasis, so PTH response, even when they are fed highly positive DCAD diets? Wow. I don't know. I mean, I, I have an idea of what happens. The animals increase their dry matter intake, which increases calcium. But I think maybe this is where uh, some old work done with parathyroid hormone related peptide kicks in. And I think Laura Hernandez at Wisconsin is onto this idea pretty, pretty heavily right now. This is a hormone. It acts just like parathyroid hormone in many respects, but it is not parathyroid hormone. It's called PTH, parathyroid hormone related peptide. And the mammary gland makes this little hormone but it doesn't start making it until maybe day four to seven in lactation. And in other species, rats, now it's been known in humans, this hormone seems to be the one that helps maintain calcium homeostasis of the lactating uh, mother. Um, once that kicks in, the normal parathyroid gland kind of goes quiet. 125 vitamin D doesn't show the big spike, but it's slightly elevated in lactation, so you're optimizing your intestinal calcium absorption. That seems to be how these cows, humans, rats, other, other mammals, how they maintain calcium levels in the blood to close to normal um, during lactation. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> that's so that's that was totally yeah. un totally unintelligible to most people because this is kind of a way out there. Um, only a few researchers have actually read all these papers. Well, yeah, and you know, so much of this is is above <laughs> my level, so I'm like, okay, thanks. Um, well, I have two more questions. I'm going to ask. I think I have two more. Um, this is going back to um, the Di the 25 hydroxy vitamin D and the dihydroxy vitamin D, which I think you said is the one that's not legal. At um, least in America. In yeah. the U.S. And so this is this is a different country. Um, why is it not a good practice to use either of those when they, they you do not feed an anionic diet to cows? Well, most of the work that was done testing those for milk fever prevention was done in diets that were not anionic. Um, and it certainly 25 hydroxy D failed to prevent milk, milk fever. So that'd be your calcidiol, your high D. The 125 dihydroxy vitamin D does prevent milk fever, but only if you give it at exactly that window of time about three days before calving to maybe six or seven days before calving. Only in that window did it work. Okay. So that, that may help answer that question for him. Um, final question that I'm answering, and this is going to um, the, the slide that you had from Allison Kerwin, which I'm going to try to find that. 65. Yep, that's it. Yeah. Well, and the one above nope, it. The one before it. Yeah. Um, so zeolite, yeah. uh, the question is again from Elena in Italy, how does it work and how do we know that it doesn't bind other minerals such as magnesium? And you did discuss that when yeah. you were, when you were talking, but reiterate, please. Yeah, this, this product is a, it's a really neat idea. The Danish, um, veterinary college, uh, Rolf Jorgensen and, and, uh, uh, Tilson Hansen and th that whole group, they, they did a lot of work trying to find something that would bind calcium so it became unavailable to the cow because it appears nobody can make a really low calcium diet like Howard Green and the group at Ohio State did. It just is impossible. But with this added to the diet, it's an aluminosilicate, so it has the ability to bind things. It has a little niches, if you will, within the crystal that will attract calcium and other cations, positively charged particles to it, particularly divalent cations. So it binds calcium, it binds magnesium, and uh, prevents them from being absorbed. It seems to also bond phosphate very nicely. And uh, European Union has a uh, treaties on this when they approved it in the European Union, it also seems to bind some of the trace minerals. Is that detrimental to the cow? Well, apparently, as far as phosphorus and magnesium go, there seem to be no real ill effects of a drop in blood, cal blood phosphorus or blood magnesium, as so long as it's temporary. Um, that's all I can tell you. It doesn't seem to be causing a problem. Now, zeolites, you may know these are also used to bind things like mycotoxins and other, there's various forms of zeolite. It's not just any kind of brand of zeolite. This was specifically manufactured, if you will, so that it would bind calcium to a high degree. Um, others are made to bind mycotoxins or other, other items of interest. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm going to call a break for this morning. We <laughs> don't think you're going to get off easy tonight. I think you probably should fortify yourself before you start the webinar because my experience with the Argentinians is there will be a lot of questions. Good. Um, Good. And I will keep feeding you questions as I get them and as people send them to me because 
um, this is one of the first webinars where I've actually had people email me with questions, even though they knew they couldn't listen. Yeah, this all means that I don't explain this very <laughs> well, and it's still a mystery to everybody. You know, that's what you said. But when um, when Paula <laughs> Torilo listened to this in Argentina, she immediately sent me a message that said, this is a fantastic webinar. Um, well, thank you. So she was super excited. So okay. you, you must be doing something right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, anybody who has lingering questions that maybe didn't get answered or didn't get adequately answered, always feel free to send us an email and we will get those to, um, to Jesse or email Jesse directly. Um, Hypocalcemia takes a little longer from the. And Jesse and Vadim, you're all unmuted. Say hello. Hi, Marianne. Hi, Marianne. Hi. Um, <laughs> Paula or Vadim, I shall defer to you. Would you like to go with questions first? Well, it doesn't matter. I can wait, but I do have a question. Okay. Um, Vadim, why don't we go with you? Okay, fine. <clears throat> well, I do have some experience in the field because I'm, by the way, managing dairies, large dairies, and um, antiotic sold diets, and then um, low calcium diets. But a question is, do you have any experience on the feeding one cow diet for far off and pre-fresh cow diets? If you do, what are you be looking for? Yeah, there, that's not uncommon in the United States, especially with the smaller dairies where they don't feel they can make a, an appropriate mix for just a few cows in the, in the close-up diet. So typically... This works better with the straw diets where you restrict the cow from getting excessive amounts of energy before mm -hmm. she calves. Um, the other thing that I have to worry about is if you are going to adopt a low calcium approach and, and it's almost impossible to do it properly without an addition such as zeolite to the diet, um, that zeolite is going to cost you two and a half times as much. Similarly, with with a uh, anionic diet, it's going to cost you two and a half times as much to feed it for 55 days rather than 21 days. So that that's one detriment of feeding the whole dry period. The other comes with anionic salts and interpreting urine pH. As the animal stays on anionic diets, over time their urine pH will drift upward. And part of that is because they're actively using their bones to buffer the effect of the diet. Now what that means is that it's still very effective in preventing milk fever, but it makes it a little more difficult for you to decide whether the cows are acidified properly. Um, because they have been drifting upward over time. We usually find that these cows may start out at about 6.2, 6.4 for urine pH two to three weeks after they're being fed the diet. And then by six or seven weeks after feeding the diet, they'll be up to about seven and a quarter, 7.5. And so it makes it a little more difficult for you to interpret urine pH. What I usually advise is that you use cows that have been on the diet about two to three weeks to judge whether or not the diet is appropriate. Okay, thanks for answer. And then another question, if you hear me. Yes. Uh, would you recommend to check the NIFA on the pre-fresh cows with the bulls diets? It doesn't matter. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a veterinarian and mm -hmm. I, should, I should love to take blood samples, but I find that too many times the NEFA levels are over-interpreted. Um, it, it's, it's true that if you have high NEFA, the cutoff would be above 0 0.4. Um, at that point, the cows probably are having a problem with the dry cow diet. Either their intakes are low, that's typically what it is, or they're too fat. The cows being too fat drops their intakes. 
I can body condition score cows a lot faster than I can take a NEFA and it's a lot cheaper. And you can pretty well tell what's going on with the pre-fresh diets. Um, Post-fresh, BHBA may be a little more informative. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've done it both. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll wait for another question if somebody else has it. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Thanks, Vadim. Um, Paula, I know you have a bunch. Do you want to do about three or four and then I'll do a few? Yes, please. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> there I go. Uh, hi, Dr. Goff. Thank hi. you. Great presentation for us. We have a lot of questions from Argentina, Uruguay, and some other countries. The first one is from Jose. Which is the best time during the day to sample urine to measure its pH relative to the anionic salt feeding? Right. And Related with this one, Matthias asked, which is the percentage of cow we should sample to measure pH? Okay, both good questions. So on a research setting, we can see that there's some variation in urine pH throughout the day, and that on a research basis, the sample you take about eight to nine hours after the cows have been fed, assuming they're fed just once a day, represents the average of all the samples that would be taken throughout the day. That's research. On farm, I'm just happy if you will check the urine pH whenever it's most convenient. It doesn't change that much. Only us researchers get worried about these small changes. For you as a, as a farmer or a nutritionist, checking when it's convenient will give you a pretty good idea of the adequacy of the diet. Now your second question was how many cows should I check? Well, Gary Etzel once told me that he had a long discussion with a uh, statistician and the statistician told him eight, you check eight cows. If there's a hundred cows in the pen, you check eight cows. If there's eight cows in the pen, you check eight cows. That's the stat statistical number. Um, and I guess that was worked out by somebody who knows mathematics a lot better than I do. Is that, that a bad number? <laughs> no, Paula, <laughs> uh, sorry, I had to get to my mic to unmute it. Paula, do you want to keep going with a few or do you need to translate? Yes. No, I have a lot. <laughs> okay, keep going okay. then. The third question from Matthias, which is the risk of very low DCAD, just low dry matter intake? Well, when the, when the cow gets overly acidified, she is, she's not feeling very good. She only has one response that she can do. She can decrease dry matter intake, give her body enough time to excrete the extra acid, and so she'll make a very acid urine. Um, you may actually see these cows when they get over acidified, they start breathing more rapidly. They're trying to remove acid using their respiratory system. The other thing that happens is not necessarily seen right away. When these cows calve and they've been overly acidified, that lack of dry matter intake really predisposes the cow to developing ketosis and uh, very often that's followed up by a displaced abomasum. Their immune system is compromised, so you'll see more metritis. It's, it's, it's bad when you over acidify cows. At anything you might have gained in terms of calcium metabolism, you've quickly lost it because the cows are just not doing well. Certainly, when I first got into making anionic diets, and I didn't realize I was over acidifying cows, we really damaged some farms. Um, I feel very guilty about it. We, we just didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how to control it. Um, checking urine pH allowed us to get a better handle on the correct degree of acidification. Um, I know that there's still many farms in America that if they hear the word anionic salt, they 
they don't like that because they had early experiences that were very bad. Now that we know that we should avoid over acidification, we can get around those problems. We also know that it's not necessary to make them extremely acidic to get good control of milk fever. We just have to take them away from metabolic alkalosis. Paula, can I ask a related question? And then yes. you can ask your other. Okay, um, this is, you may have answered this, um, and I'm, I now have a second answer <laughs> or a second question. Is there any harm and or value in feeding a DCAD diet for the entire dry period? Um, also, would it be beneficial to feed a DCAD diet for the first few days after calving? Ooh, good. Well, okay. So, so feeding it for the entire dry period, it's expensive. And like I mentioned earlier, um, it means that you're, adjustment of urine pH, how you're going to interpret changes a little bit because the first two to three weeks, you can follow the outlines that we had in that one slide that we'd like to have urine pH 6.2 to 6.3. But after you continually feed anions for a long, longer period of time, say six, seven, eight weeks, at that point, the urine pH starts drifting up and the cow compensates by removing more and more calcium from her bones. This is great. This is what we want her to do to prevent milk fever, but her urine pH rises and you may get the impression, oh, I need to add more anions to the diet because the closer up cows still have high urine pH. So don't get fooled by that. If the urine pH of cows that are on the diet for two to three weeks is 6.2, that's, that's, perfectly fine. They won't, they won't get milk fever later. Um, the first two days of, uh, of uh, lactation, that's a, a really interesting question. When we first started doing anionic diets, we realized the cows were still struggling to maintain normal blood calcium for at least 24 hours after they calved. And so our very earliest experiments, we left cows on the anionic diet for the first 24 hours. In terms of practicality on farm, that became a total mess. It was too hard to put cows into a lactating group and still feed them an anionic diet. And by and large, the difference in blood calcium that we were seeing as a result of leaving them in one extra day, it wasn't worth it. It, it wasn't a very big difference. Um, now, I, I mentioned that perhaps one of the benefits of the oral calcium boluses is that they acidify the cow. And so in essence, you're getting a partial low DCAD diet on day one of lactation by using these calcium chloride containing boluses. So maybe that's why they seem to work despite the fact they don't have enough calcium in, in them to really boost blood calcium greatly. Okay, um, in your experience, do jerseys have a lower pH? Lower um, urine, urine pH, sorry. No, um, no, their intake of the diet is lower. So if you think about how the cow reacts, it's just like when we feed calcium. We, we need to feed 100 grams of calcium per day to a lactating cow. We need to make the diet a certain percent. This DCAD is sort of like a percent of the diet. We really need to consider how much anion load the cow is actually taking on. And so that's a contribution of the DCAD times the amount of diet she's actually eating. So as far as we can tell, a diet with Jersey's and Holstein's mixed, their urine pHs tend to be about the same because they're, they're eating an equivalent amount for their body weight in general. Okay, um, I'll ask one more question and then if Paula is ready or if Vadim would like to, I'll turn the mic over to someone else. Um, what do you think of adding antibiotic salts and calcium boluses to the same cows? Uh, well, can you put me onto that slide that's got like a titration curve of urine pH and decad? <laughs> 
Yes, I'll scroll through them and you'll tell me when I'm close. Okay. It was more than three quarters of the way through. I think. Okay. There, up. Oh. <laughs> this one, one? one? Yep. Our favorite slide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so if I am, let's say I'm at a urine pH of about 6.2. Kind of the kind of what I've been trying to promote. If I give that cow, and and now the cow calves, she goes on a lactating ration, which is going to typically be plus two hundred to plus three hundred milliequivalents per kilogram. So that should be an alkalinizing diet. If I give that cow a calcium bolus, it might bring her urine pH back down a bit, and give her that one extra day of acidification without going into an over acidified state. Now, if I happen to believe that I should keep urine pHs down around 5.5, 5.8, I am close to being in an uncompensated acidosis zone. If I give these cows one of these calcium boluses, I might start to push some of the cows over the edge where they go from a compensated acidosis to an uncompensated metabolic acidosis. And certainly I've seen this where some farms are giving two of these boluses at calving because they don't want to come back and retreat them 12 to 24 hours later. And I have seen cows routinely being put into an uncompensated acidosis. Again, this is great for their uh, calcium status, but they're not going to eat. And a cow who doesn't eat on day one of lactation, guaranteed to have a big rush of fat come off her adipose tissue and head to her liver and begin the whole process of ketosis and fatty liver. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Vadim, would you like to take a turn at questions or do you, do you not have more? I will unmute you. Hi, Vid <laughs> Hi, Vadim. <laughs> Did you hear me now? I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I didn't, I didn't ask him yet. Oh, Dr. Goff, um, uh, I heard a theory that um, low calcium in a fresh cow, that could happen not just because of a diet, because the cow doesn't feel well for right. some other reason, maybe stress or something else. How, what do you think about it? Yeah, there, there's no doubt that cows can have uh, mastitis or metritis and be going into endotoxic shock. It's, you know, it's not unusual to see a cow who's recumbent and can't stand up. And uh, you think they have milk fever, but if you look carefully, they have uh, an E. coli type mastitis. And that endotoxin will cause blood calcium to fall. It usually doesn't fall down below about six, but the blood calcium will be will often be six and a half to seven and a half. So you're, she is hypocalcemic, but this is a result of endotoxic shock, not the typical milk fever type situation. Now, do those cows respond with calcium? There's a nice study that Lance Baumgard's uh, graduate student, Aaron Hurst, um, has published, I think now. It's, I think it's published. And uh, they've shown that by giving calcium slowly, intravenously, they can get those cows to recover a little bit faster from the endotoxic shock. Be careful. A cow with endotoxic shock and you give her a full bottle of calcium intravenously, typical for a milk fever cow, that heart muscle is very sensitive to the calcium under endotoxic shock. And so you have a much higher chance of killing the cow with calcium when she's in endotoxic shock. So you have to give it slowly. Got it. Thank you. Okay, Vadim, should I have um, Paula ask some questions? Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Paula, go ahead. Hi, uh, Paula. This question from Danielle. What do you think about milking partially the fresh cows to avoid hypocalcemia? 
Oh, that's an old, old trick. Um, yeah, that used to be done by farmers uh, because they would feel that they would slow the loss of calcium from the blood and prevent hypocalcemia. And it, and it does work. Um, remember, though, that you're also leaving milk inside that mammary gland that's trying to produce milk. It's all set up to produce milk. So you're going to have leaky teat ends because there's so much pressure in the mammary gland. And so you're much more likely to develop mastitis in those cows as a result of the partial milking. So be careful. It, it can help prevent milk fever, but I think we have better options today than to, than to do the partial uh, milking. The risk of mastitis is a little too high for me. Okay, thanks. The other question is from Gonzalo, which is your recommendation to avoid hy hypocalcemia under grazing systems where no anionic salts can be fed? Yeah, well, there are a couple of things that have been tried and work to some extent. Oh, you're translating. Okay. Um, so if you choose the right grasses, you can perhaps go after the low calcium diet theory. But again, it's very difficult to make a truly low calcium diet that will make a difference. Um, you're, you're, you're not going to have great luck with this. After having said that, if you could bring cows in once a day and offer them up some grain, I know in uh, New Zealand and Australia, they'll sometimes do this for the close-up cows, give them a small amount of grain, and in that grain they'll put some anionic salt. They're not going to be able to acidify these animals, but they are going to be able, be able to take them from a severe metabolic alkalosis to a marginally alkalotic state and that seems to have some benefit. Um, one idea is to boost the magnesium in that diet as well because a big problem with pastured cows is that they tend to be low in blood magnesium as well. Most of the forages that they're eating are marginal for magnesium. So that's what you can do dietarily um, and that those are not great choices. What I would suggest is that when cows calve, I assume you can bring them up to be milked and handle them at least once. Uh, this would be a time to give them an oral calcium gel, drench, or bolus. And uh, that probably has to be repeated again at 12 to 24 hours to keep these animals on their feet. But again, that's somewhat slightly acidifying if you use calcium chloride and you're getting a slight boost in blood calcium so you can keep these animals on their feet and give them give their body time to adapt there may be some tricks down the road and it depends on the country you're in whether or not you can utilize calcitriol or 125 dihydroxy vitamin d it, it's not an option for us in the united states right now estados unidos en este momento Oh, Paula, um, would you like to ask some questions or I have some that I can ask? I, I can, I can, if you Okay, keep me. going then. Okay. Yes. Uh, there is a question from Martin. What do you think about combining intravenous calcium plus a low calcium liberating strategy? And what would you use after the intravenous calcium to avoid the bounding effect? I'm not sure if you already talked about that. Well, I, th I think giving the intravenous calcium to cows that are still standing and still in reasonable shape, I think that study by the California people, Noelia De Silva's grad students, uh, that pretty much told me that, that isn't the greatest option. Um, perhaps you could give subcutaneous calcium 
remembering though that when you give subcutaneous calcium, you have to also be careful about causing infections and in all the different sites that you're going to give it. You can't give a whole bottle of, you cannot give a whole bottle of calcium to a cow in one spot subcutaneously. It will cause an abscess to form. You could choose some subcutaneous calcium. You can choose to give them the oral calcium boluses as well. Um, because those are relatively simple. You could drench the cow if you've got the patience to drench them. That would do a great job. But combining intravenous calcium with an oral calcium bolus at the same time doesn't really gain you anything. Um, it's not going to extend the length of time that the treatment will work. Another thing that's common in America is that veterinarians will often give one bottle of calcium intravenously to cows with milk fever, and then another bottle of calcium subcutaneously. And that's probably not a good idea. That will really shut off calcium homeostasis, and it only, it doesn't extend the period of treatment beyond six or seven hours anyway. So it's, it's not the answer. Um, I'm not sure, if, did I answer that question that you were asking as a prevention, those same same ideas hold. Um, I would avoid the IV calcium now. Okay, um, Paula? Yes, thank you. Okay, no, I, I just realized that uh, Mimi is not translating the, the questions to our, in our platform. So if okay. she's listening, okay. She's listening. Uh, question number eight. Uh, does calcium carbonate in fresh cows improve dry matter intake? Well, so define that. In fresh cows, you mean in the lactating cow diet or in the pre-fresh close-up diet? So I, I guess I'll just go, uh, you probably aren't committed to making an answer one way or the other. So I'll give you both answers, okay? Bueno, les voy a dar las dos respuestas. I think it's post uh, freshening. Okay. You you <laughs> should you should be putting limestone in those cows diets because it's cheap and they need a lot of calcium after they calve. Um one of the questions is how much calcium should we be feeding to the fresh cow? And I have the feeling that if we could make a special fresh cow diet, I would boost the calcium in the diet well above 1.1% in those cows. So let me, let me go through a little bit on calcium in both the close-up diet and the fresh cow diet. If I go with the thoughts of some nutritionists, they would like to see the close-up diet contain 1.5% calcium or even more, and they would like to see about 170 to maybe as much as 200 grams of calcium to be fed to the cow prior to calving. Okay. After calving, these same nutritionists usually put the cow on a diet that's about 0 0.85 to maybe 1.1% 1, 1 .1 calcium. That's typical lactating cow calcium concentration. Two things. Why do I put a cow on a diet that's 1.5% calcium when she's at a very low requirement for dietary calcium? She can meet her needs with a diet that's about 0.45% calcium. Why do I kick it to 1.5% calcium? And then the day she calves, when she really needs a high calcium diet, I'm going to drop her from 1.5, 1.7% calcium, drop it down to 0.85, 1.2% calcium. That, that rationale has escaped me. One of the things that we have seen is, again, going back to the slide with the urine pH titration, what we have seen is sometimes when the diet 
causes urine pH to be around 5.5, 5.6. By adding limestone to that diet, you are alkalinizing the cow. So you may be taking some of those cows from a state of uncompensated metabolic acidosis to a state where now they're into compensated metabolic acidosis. If you look at that graph, urine pH at say minus 250 milliequivalents per kilogram is gonna be pretty much the same around 5.5 as it will when the cow is at minus 175 milliequivalents per kilogram. Again, urine pH of 5.5. But the cow who's on the lower DCAD diet might have been pushed into an uncompensated metabolic acidosis state. Her dry matter intake will be greatly reduced if limestone can take that cow and push her to a, a more compensated metabolic acidosis. Even though her urine pH is essentially the same, the body sees that as a more compensated metabolic acidosis. And so that may be why there's some benefit when you're feeding a, a high DCAD diet to adding extra limestone to the animal's diet. In early lactation, I think these cows would probably do a little bit better if we could make a higher calcium diet just for that 10 days, two weeks after they calve. Okay, Paula, um, shall I do a few questions to give you a chance? I'm going to go ahead. Um, I have a, a, one of the, our listeners who says they have several farms that use FOS aid in fresh cows. Is there any benefit from this product in your opinion? Well, FOS aid, now I got to think about which one that is. That's the sodium phosphate product. Okay, what they're trying to do is prevent the hypophosphatemic downer cow. Some cows, we don't know exactly why, but some cows, particularly here in the northern climates, uh, and particularly this time of year, February, March, April is when we tend to see most of them, these cows maybe had milk fever, they were given a bottle of calcium intravenously, their blood calcium is corrected, but they failed to stand up. And sometimes when you look at the blood of these animals, their blood phosphorus level will be below one milligram per deciliter. If you give them sodium phosphate intravenously, or perhaps even orally, those cows' blood phosphorus will, will correct. And sometimes if you get to them early enough, they will stand up. It does appear that low blood phosphorus is the reason those animals were unable to rise to their feet. Now, I said that this occurs when blood phosphorus falls below about one milligram per deciliter. Unfortunately, normal blood, mag blood phosphorus is between four and six milligrams per deciliter, and many veterinarians who pull a blood sample and see a blood magnesium... Uh, sorry, blood phosphorus level of about two and a half to three milligrams per deciliter get upset. And they say, oh, the animal's hypophosphatemic. She needs to get this phosphorus treatment. That cow would recover on her own. As soon as you correct her blood calcium, her rumen motility would, would take off again, and she would absorb dietary phosphorus that has been sequestered in the rumen, she would correct herself. You don't need to treat that cow. But if the blood phosphorus actually is below one milligram per deciliter, it does appear that the sodium phosphate treatment helps them. It's just, I'm a, I'm a little concerned because I think a lot of veterinarians get really worked up over a slightly low blood phosphorus level. And, and those cows would recover without treatment. Okay, um, I'm going to ask a series of questions. This is from uh, an emailed 
um, questions that I had earlier this day that we didn't cover in the morning topics. So they're all on anionic salts. Um, to formulate anionic salts, um, one, how much is the target range of decad per kilogram of product to ensure that it's, that it's effective in lowering urine pH by feeding roughly 0.5 kilograms per day of the product? Well, every product's a little bit different. Um, <laughs> you can't say one size of everybody's anion and product fits all. You also have to take a look again at this titration graph. If you're starting off with a higher potassium diet and your diet has a decad of plus 400, it's going to take more anion product to bring them down to a urine pH of 6.2 than if they start out at a plus 200 diet. So that's where controlling dietary potassium is always the first thing that the nutritionist should do. Now, what is the target decad? If you followed all those little rules that I had for where phosphorus should be, where sodium should be, and you're reasonably close to controlling potassium, and you're using primarily chloride as your anion source, I have pretty good confidence after looking at a lot of these diets that I'll have a urine pH somewhere around 6.2 when I'm as, at about minus 75 milliequivalents per kilogram of diet, okay? So that's probably a, a target you can shoot for on the computer, and then check the urine pH to see if you're reasonably close. There are things in these DCAD equations that are not necessarily totally biologically correct. Um, Everybody uses the, the equation of sodium plus potassium minus sulfur plus chloride. But remember, calcium is alkalinizing. Magnesium is alkalinizing. Phosphate is slightly acidifying, but you don't want to add phosphate for the reasons we talked about earlier. Um, ammonium is, is a cation. If you have lots of uh, uh, alfalfa or silages, uh, grass silages in your diet, you might be getting a lot of ammonium in your diet, which would be an alkalinizing factor. Um, there's other things we don't even know how to control. And uh, I remember in Arizona, we fed a diet that should have acidified the cows, but it didn't. And it was a very hot day. And uh, I saw the cows and they were respiring very quickly, which means they were blowing off carbon dioxide as they breathed, which means they were starting to become alkalotic during the day. Hmm. You, there's things that we're not always aware of sitting at a computer and formulating a ration. Yeah, so. I, I um, unfortunately have to often say the cows don't lie, the computer will. That's right. <laughs> so, That's right. Um, so in, in a follow-up from that, with regard to mineral sulfates and mineral chlorides um, that are differ in solubility and palatability, how much is the optimum relative usage of mineral sulfites versus mineral chlorides, chlorides at the, in the case that sweetener is used or not? Sweetener, I'm not even... I well, assume they mean molasses. I, I believe so. Um, Low-K molasses? Yeah, yeah. If you get certain, oh boy, if it's... Uh, this is in the Middle East, if that helps you. Okay. Well, let's, let's take, take this apart a little bit. The first part of the question was, uh, say it again, Marianne, I'm okay, sorry. Okay, and I'm sorry. Um, sh do I go back to the, this is all part of one question, or... Um, just the most recent part of it that I asked. The uh, first part, I think. Okay. Um, with regard to mineral sulfates and mineral uh, yeah. chloride. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The chloride salts are absorbed with about 100% efficiency. So they're very predictable in terms of how they're going to acidify the animal. They almost are all universally soluble. I'm trying to think if there's any kind of form that's not very soluble. No, chlorides are all very soluble. So that also means they're very predictable in the response. 
The sulfates do differ in their solubilities, but if you're feeding this over a period of weeks, that becomes less of an issue because almost all of these become available or soluble after they pass through the abomasum. So the sulfates will be absorbed in the lower part of the tract uh, pretty well. What we, what we know is that at low inclusion rates, sulfate salts are absorbed quite nicely, almost 100%. But as you get to higher levels of sulfate in the diet, the body seems to shut down the absorption of sulfate. So when you get above about 0.3, 0.35% sulfate, sulfate absorption drops dramatically. So overall, when we look, we say that sulfate is about 60% as, a, as absorbable as chloride. Okay. Now, continuing to follow up on that, and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure you'll be able to to say anything about this, the best sources of mineral sulfates versus mineral chlorides to use to formulate anionic products in terms of effectiveness and relative costs. Oh boy, um, costs are all over the board. I don't know yeah. what it would be. Um, in Arabia, uh, you're close to the ocean. I assume you're doing all the this is going to sound bad, but you're doing all the desalination of water. Yeah, no, it's 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 not quite Arabia. Um, Middle East, a little bit further north. Okay. Well, <laughs> if you have access to desalinated water, they ha often have magnesium chloride as a brine, as a liquid. That would be a, a nice source of anions. Again, this might be where he was talking about adding molasses or something to sweeten it um, so that you can get the cows to consume it. Uh, yeah. But but whether you use chloride or sulfate, all you have to do is figure that sulfate is only about 60% as acidifying as chloride on a equivalent basis. So if you want to add 100 equivalents of acidification, you would have to add what 100 divided by 0.6 of the sulfate to get to the same level. Okay, I, it's too late in the day for me to do math. Yeah, I can't do it either. <laughs> it strikes me it's like 12.5, but that can't be right. 18 point something maybe. Anyway. Uh, it'd be 100 and, 130 something. Yeah, yeah. See, too late in the day to do math. Yeah. Um, Finally, and this is the final question from that region, um, what sweeteners except for low K molasses do you recommend to use in anionic salts and what level of usage? Oh, sweeteners. Um, you know, outside of molasses, we don't have a lot of choices here that we use. People have done experiments here where they use actual sucrose. Um, but it's, it's too expensive um, to generally put into a dry cow diet. Um, I guess I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to, well, you know, this is the Iran, Iraq, Pakistan area. I'm not yeah. sure what, what sweeteners there are that are in, available in that area. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they have citrus uh, pulps and citrus Maybe. Type. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, the main thing is with these commercial products, um, many of them have managed to put the anions into feed particles, actually put them inside the feed particles through wet milling processes that keep that animal from tasting it as much. Mm -hmm. So that, that, the need for a sweetener to get them to eat the anion is reduced. Um, if you're going to go to the traditional salts, try to keep the inclusion rate low. That means work on keeping potassium as low in the diet as you can. Okay. Um, I have no more questions, and Paula probably still has a whole bunch. So, Paula, I'm going to let you unmute and go to it. How are you doing? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, a question from Matias. Do you recommend measuring routinely blood ketones in fresh cows? 
I am not one of those guys who likes to check blood BHBA three times in the first 10 days after calving. And I know this is driving a stake into the heart of my good friend, Gary Etzel. Um, and I know that there's a new movement to do this with the blood BHBA meters and uh, check routinely after a cow's freshen. It's a very specific test, very sensitive test. There's no doubt about it when it, when it comes up positive that these animals need to be looked at. Um, the cutoff point of uh, 14 milligrams per deciliter, and I think that's the same as 1.4 millimolar. Um, that cutoff, usually people say if they're above that, then you give them treatment. I think sometimes animals are being treated that don't need to be treated. If they're still ruminating, still making good, good milk, um, I'm not sure giving them the propylene glycol is that beneficial. On the other hand, I am kind of a proponent of checking cows fairly routinely for urine uh, ketones, and it's only because I'm very cheap. Uh, that'll cost you about 20 cents a piece versus the blood BHBA, which is probably a minimum of $2 a piece um, to check. I do like the idea of paying closer attention to ketones and getting to these cows earlier. Uh, probably the thing that's going to change dairy farming the most will be a wide scale adoption of these rumination monitors. Cows that are developing a ketosis that's going to be a problem, they'll stop ruminating or greatly reduce their rumination rate a day before they ever show clinical signs. Some cows though that will have a 1.4, 1.5, uh, millimolar reading on the BHBA meter, if their rumination rate suggests the animal is doing just fine, leave her alone. Um, I think that's going to be a great addition to our management tools to get widespread adoption of these rumination monitors. So that probably was a convoluted answer saying, I don't check BHBA by blood on every cow the way a lot of people are suggesting. Paula, it looks like you have just about three more questions. Am I wrong? <laughs> yes, I do. I do. All right, keep going. One, one is related with the sulfate and chlor chloride things you were talking about recently. Uh, Fernando want, wants to know about the quantity of those salts. Well, uh, the quantity of uh, sulf magnesium sulfate and magnesium chloride in pre-fresh cows. So this is why there are several driveways in the state of Iowa. I'm not allowed to go up. Taking a formula and saying, let's give 100 grams mag sulfate, 150 grams of ammonium chloride, and uh, 50 grams of calcium sulfate. Those kinds of formulas were what many of us tried many years ago. And unfortunately, it was not tailored to a particular herd. So we often caused an uncompensated acidosis in those cows, or we went the other way and div didn't give them enough anion to actually get the cow acidified. A formula like that doesn't work. You have to make a calculation based on the forages and the potassium content of those forages for each, each herd. Um, a one size fits all does not work. If you, if you want to go that route, the zeolite product will work if you can get your diet calcium below about 0 0.65, 0.7%. And that's one size fits all. Every cow gets 500 grams of the zeolite product according to the package label. Okay, the last two questions. Do you, do you have experience adding chloride salts in water to, to pre-fresh cows? No. 
I don't know that you could get it done um, and still get the animals to drink enough water. I don't, I don't think I want to inhibit their dry matter intake uh, by adding enough anions to get them acidified. Uh, it, it's possible to add magnesium chloride in very small amounts or magnesium sulfate in very small amounts to meet the magnesium requirement of the animal. But to get them acidified, the amount would be much greater. And I don't think you're going to get them to drink that water voluntarily. Okay, Paula. Final okay, question. the last one. Yeah. Final question. Can you make some comments about calcium sources regarding bioavailability and sources of calcium carbonate? Yeah. Um, so this is general. Calcium carbonate tends to be pretty well absorbed by most animals. Um, probably in the area of 65% of that calcium is, is bioavailable. Now you can affect that with the particle size of the limestone. Uh, the more fine it is, the more absorbable it is. And probably what's most important is that in a lactating cow diet, you may get some rumen buffering or rumen alkalinization action from very, very finely ground limestone that you won't get from coarsely ground limestone. Limestone always becomes available or more available after it passes through the abomasum. So that's regular old limestone. When you look at dolomitic limestone, which has a much higher magnesium content, that tends to form a much harder crystal. That's probably why Michelangelo chose dolomitic limestone to make the statues because he knew it would last longer. Dolomitic can be available, but you have to grind it to a very, very fine powder to make it work. Um, as a rule, its bioavailability is going to be less than what we'd call limestone or low magnesium limestone. Does that make some sense? Yes, Good. I think so. Okay. All right. Um, Paula, unless you get more questions, I have no more questions. Um, then I think that we are going to, to let everybody go home for the night. How's that sound? Okay. Thank you very much. Both. Sounds good. Thank, it was thank a you for all great, the questions. Great webinar. <laughs> yes. Yes. Jesse, again, thank you so much. Um, Paula, great questions. Vadim left a little bit ago and he said he greatly appreciated an amazing webinar. Well, good. I, I hope people get something out of it. I'm we, sure we they will. We yeah. shouldn't see very many milk fever cows these days. We know how we know how to fix it. <laughs> <laughs>